You're listening to the Around the Lens podcast, the home of high quality, roundtable, visual journalism discussion about the news, topics, and gear related to our career field. Now, here's the host of our show, David J. Murphy. Hello Hello, and welcome to episode 241 of Around the Lens. I'm your host, David J. Murphy. Joining me this week are my regular co-host, Travis Keyes, a freelance photographer and APA (laughs) chairman based out of New York. I gotta get those uh, yeah, pronouns. Right now, right. that would just roll off the tongue. But you, you're ready to like go into multiple different things. Your head's all over the place. What's going on, Dave? How are you well, doing? Well, I should have said is my regular co-host as opposed to are. And but I, anyways, yeah. I won't go stuck there. In the, in the in the wording, yeah. It's all syntax and verbiage. It all happens. It all anyways, happens. Indeed, indeed. You doing all right, bud? Hanging in there as much as one can in this crazy, crazy world of ours. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> All right, our guest this week, our returning panelist, uh, first, our guest this week is a returning panelist by the name of David Bateau. He is a Washington, D.C.-based uh, photojournalist. Uh, hello, David. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Dave? Good to see you. Uh, I'm doing great. Hopefully, I said your last name correctly. Um, not exactly, but we'll roll with it. No, no, no. Please, correct the record. No, let's hear it the oh, right. Okay. Correct the Actually, but- Buto is how I Buto, pronounce it. Buto, I mean, Buto. Buto. There's, there's no you. one right way to say it, but that's, you know, that's the way I say it. So. Well, I, I strive for perfection on this show, as always. Zero technical difficulties. Everything works <laughs> just fine. And um, one day that will happen. Yeah. And the show will be over. We'll just call it quits that day. Be, it'll never get better. <laughs> that's right. That'll be yeah. the last show we ever do because nothing will have gone wrong. So I'm like, well, I can't well, I can't repeat this. Yeah, it's kind of boring now. So, yeah. Well, that was a perfect show. And that will be our last show. Thank you. All course. right. That's been our show. Thank you for everybody. I don't know. Uh, we also have a new guest joining this week, a new new panelist, never been on the show before, uh, Mr. Graham Jennings. Uh, he is a staff photographer with the Washington Examiner, also based out of Washington, D.C. Hello, Graham. How are you? Very good, Dave. How are you? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Welcome to the show. How is everything where you're at? Um, peaceful right now. Um, <laughs> it's pretty quiet. Pretty quiet in DC, you know. It's the uh, it's a long weekend, and it's the it's the more or less the end of summer now, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of people are at the beach. Uh, so and I can see you're at, you're at the beach, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't. I, uh, <laughs> I didn't get there this year, but uh, maybe you know, maybe maybe uh, s- some point uh, towards the end of the year. I don't know. Uh, I normally go home to New Zealand at the end of the year, but that oh, won't wow. be happening. Cool, cool. So you're well, from New Zealand good, originally. Good good time not to be at the beach, I would say. <laughs> yeah. In terms well, of Graham places put, in terms of places so you can social distance, I gotta say the beach is probably the best of them if you're not you know you can you can get away from people i don't want to be a people even when there's not a pandemic i don't know i, I wouldn't say it's the best of them i would say maybe a big state park or something like that yeah. you know uh, you know you know you could be out in alaska state parks that's probably a little safer social distancing maybe you know with you and the moose <laughs> <laughs> hey i don't know if they've proven if m- moose can have uh, a track can track covid but be careful <laughs> don't let them too close to you well grandma play with moose. Graham, happy to have yeah. you on. We're going to talk about your experiences with the the Washington Examiner. I do have a question though, for beaches. Where do you guys go for the beach in DC? Maryland. When you want to get to the beach. Um, so- California is my answer there you to go. that. It's but, the best. Yeah, I, but, uh, sorry. Go ahead, Graham. I uh, I would say I would say Maryland. Uh, so um, I like to go out to Assateague. Assateague and Chicateague, the you know with the ponies, yeah, yeah it's yeah. so nice there. I remember my my grandparents used to live in uh, in Watergate, and uh, we used to like get up really really early, and I hated it. We're like, oh, we have to wake up at four in the morning. I'm like, why? And we'd go out and we'd we'd get, head to the uh, Chicateague and Assateague, and especially for the pony crossing, which is awesome. Yeah, I um, the last time I was there, uh, which was well, maybe yeah, maybe this time last year actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, we we saw some ponies just walking around the beach and just eating out eating people's food. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, putting their noses in the uh, they've been domesticated, <laughs> cool, eating out of the coolers. Yeah. <laughs> oh so my goodness! In- indeed, indeed. No, I, I was in Maryland for um, up in uh, near Fort Meade area, and uh, I went around to I think. 
one of the beaches I went to is like right near, the, I think, the Delaware Bridge. If uh, I'm, There's like a beach area. So this is like the only place I could find where I could fly a drone in the general like Maryland, D.C. Yeah. metro area. So it's a very nice beach. Anyways. Uh, so, so, Dave, you, you used, uh, you said Fort Meade and drone in the same sentence over <laughs> Skype. And I just wondered if somebody's, you know, tapping into the show right now. I wouldn't be shocked. <laughs> Well, as I always say, and I'll tell Gary, hey, Gary, you know, the FBI agent who's probably and, listening and, and, and to me at all times. And from South Korea, which is, you know, all three in one, yeah. you know. <laughs> exactly. Right, right. Well, yeah. you know, people don't really talk about the benefits of, you know, constantly, you know, you, you always have somebody who has a backup of your photos. So it's like, you know, it's great. Anyways, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay, I'm I can. There's on a, a server th- somewhere. Right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, no, that's good. If, if, a red, if a red bead of light gets on my forehead, just let me know so I can. That, that means the show's over. <laughs> yeah. No, you guys carry on the show. You know, my my dead lifeless body can just sit here. You guys can carry on the show without me. All right. Well, we got a lot of great stuff to talk about today, um, and I want to open up first, of course, as we always do uh, when we have new people on the show. We always give our guests the first opportunity to speak about a given subject. And since our subject is political photography, our first topic tonight, uh, I feel no better than to give it over to Graham. Uh, Graham, you know, you've been with the Washington Examiner for 10 years, uh, but since we don't really know you and your background, why don't you go and start by telling us a little bit about you as a, as a you know, visual journalist, photojournalist, and kind of how you came up into the world and where you are now. Give us a little bio. Yeah. Um, like I said before, I'm from New Zealand. Um, I grew up there as a kid, and I... If we're going to start from zero, I would say I studied uh, photography in uh, high school, and then I went to college, and I did four years there, and then I went, uh, I got work straight out of college, actually, um, which I was lucky because, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, once you leave. What, what restaurant was it? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just uh, I did work in a supermarket for a while there when I was in uh, high school, but you know, um, uh, but I was lucky enough to get work um, freelancing straight out of college. I uh, worked on a, a book project called uh, New Zealand: The Millennium, which was with uh, a guy by the name of Neil Farron, who was a British photographer who had come to New Zealand and moved there, and he was working with all these other photographers from around the world, even some National Geographic photographers like Michael Yamashita, uh, who who uh, came to New Zealand and we photographed New Zealand as it was moving into the year 2000. And I photographed various different things like uh, a rodeo, um, a uh, gay pride parade, all these different things. And uh, he sort of really gave me a, um, a springboard there, actually, to go and work, work with other magazines in New Zealand and uh, <clears throat> I was working with magazines. I wasn't really doing any newspaper work um, at that point. And then I—I uh, I think it was 2000 and so uh, let's see, 2001, early 2001. I moved to the, uh, the UK, and I—I um, uh, I was I was actually uh, when I first moved there, I was working in, in a couple of pubs, you know, because I just moved in, I just transitioned, and I didn't know anybody. Uh, but then <clears throat> I got my footing, and I started doing freelance work. Uh, I started working uh, a little bit with some NGOs, the Danish Refugee Council, Norwegian People's Aid. I went to uh, went and covered uh, landmine removal in Bosnia. Uh, uh, worked with the uh, uh, Norwegian People's Aid in uh, Chechnya, um, and uh, went to some interesting places to do that with them. Um, and then. I left the UK in 2000 and 2007, and I came to Washington. Um, I met a girl, <laughs> so I uh, moved here for that. Um, and I, <clears throat> I uh, 2008 was, you know, as we all know, wasn't a very good year. So I wasn't really doing much in 2008, to be honest, uh, when I moved here. Plus, I was also just, you know, going through the the process with USCIS to to get my uh, work working visa and that kind of thing. So, uh, and it was, you know, Washington was completely different to London. I was just kind of, I was like, wow, where do I start here? You know, uh, so I reached out to different people and and uh, made some contacts. Uh, and uh, it was two thousand and 
2011, um, where I first started with the Examiner. And the Examiner at the time uh, wasn't what it is now. It was actually a uh, local newspaper. And it was a daily newspaper. And we covered predominantly uh, local news. So I was covering uh, City Hall. I was covering the mayor's office. Uh, I was covering you know, car accidents. Um, and, uh, you know, just basically stuff that was happening um, in and around D.C. and the larger D uh, metro D.C. area. So, and that was fun. Um, I, I really enjoyed doing that. Um, uh, so, moving on from there, um, the examiner changed. Um, uh, the owner wanted to, wanted to concentrate on politics, and so we changed, and it turned into a magazine. Uh, I can't remember which year it was now. I think it was maybe five or six years ago now. So that's when I... Uh, oh, no, it's actually much further back than that. But uh, So from there, I was just purely concentrating on uh, politics, so predominantly uh, Capitol Hill. Um, so, uh, and that, so that's where I am now. Um, and that was during the Obama years. So... Uh, <clears throat> And so that's, that's where we are. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you, I mean, how do you think, uh, and it is for you as well, David, you know, how do you think political photography has changed over, you know, the, the generation, over the decade, you know, going from you know, Bush to Obama to now President Trump? Yeah, why don't, why don't you take that one, Graham? Because you've, uh, you've sort of been here through, uh, through, through those, those years. Yeah, I haven't. I wasn't here for for Bush or, or Clinton, mm. obviously. But mm. uh, what was it like during Nixon's era? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's there's photographers here um, who 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 were here for that. Um, I, I I can think of at least one. Have they but, talked uh, to you about how they have seen the the landscape change since that they era? They have. Yeah, they have, and and uh, um. It it certainly uh, certainly during the Obama years everything was more um, predictable. Uh, covering uh, confirmation hearings and and th things on the Hill were very uh, were more more st structured or more you could you knew what was happening on the day and you could predict what was happening. Um, and maybe towards the end of his presidency, everything was very quiet. I mean, certainly the last year of his presidency, there was, I don't remember much of anything that was particularly interesting, I don't think, to me. But now, um, you know, as, as soon as this new administration ca came in, it really sort of, uh, I mean, the news cycle really, gosh, it really took off and, and Twitter just exploded, as we know. And and Twitter uh, has, well, became the, the go-to for the, getting the news really because it was just like happening constantly all the time like this instead of instead of instead of every instead of a news cycle every every day it's like every maybe every hour sometimes in this town so um, <clears throat> yeah it certainly got uh, the news cycle certainly ramped up uh, tremendously uh, once, once uh, this new this new administration uh, took hold, and and coming in from sort of the sort of fresh eyes perspective, David, you know, how have you sort of, um, you know, not only seen what, you know, covering the political landscape is now, but also talking to folks who have been in sort of the industry, kind of, the, have they talked to you about what it was like before you came into the, the uh, sort of scene? A, a little bit, yeah. I think like what, what Graham was talking about it. I, I can't remember if you use the word predictable, but uh, that's kind of the general vibe that I got from uh, from talking to people who've been here longer than I have. You know, I just I, I came here in kind of the middle of uh, 2017. So Trump had been president for several months and I was at the time living in California and sort of bouncing back and forth. Um, so uh, for me, it was all brand new. But right. yeah, everybody, everybody that I talked to who's who's been working here for a while just said that, uh, you know, just the the sort of the general uh, interest in what was going on in Washington was much higher so that there were more photographers working here. People were working at the White House, um, 
you know, there was just there was just more people doing stuff. Like, I mean, for for example, um, one of the photo opportunities that you can do at the White House is when the president uh, flies off of the South Lawn, you know, by helicopter. So um, if, uh, you know, there's a couple of different like press pass designations at the White House and there's pool and there's hard passes and it's, I don't want to get into the minutia of all that, but basically if you have a credential to go to the White House, uh, you can go and photograph or film that departure, they call it. So uh, during the Obama years, he would usually just leave the uh, Oval Office or the residence, uh, walk to the helicopter, get on, and that was it. But, you know, uh, President Trump often likes to use that opportunity to talk to the media. So he'll come over and talk for 10, 15 minutes sometimes. So that means that um, that's you know, why people we, don't... That's, well, that's why I, I see or, you know, I see a lot of reports or news. You know, his, his quotes are, are with a airplane engine in the background, right? Or well, air, yeah, it's with helicopter the, engine. With the hel- helicopter engine, yeah, Marine yeah. One. They call, so, it, uh, they call it chopper talk. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, right. And that, that's so something that means, that's new. That's something that President Trump has done that other presidents haven't done. I, I think other presidents have done that, but they haven't done it as much. You know, okay. that would be the exception rather than sort of something that you would expect. So now, like, if you have if you have credentials to get into the White House, it's like you want to go do that because that's what's going to be an opportunity if you're doing video with sound, you know, to maybe get a sound bite of him, um, or if you're just doing stills, you know, it's just a fresh daily uh, opportunity that you'd have to to get pictures of the president, which you know, from my understanding, you weren't able to do on such a regular basis. Uh, during Obama and, and probably, you know, most presidents before him as well. So, yeah, it just means that there are more people there. You know, it's really crowded, you know, right. instead of being like, you know, 15 photographers, cameramen, a few reporters, you know, there's like, you know, it could be like 50 people, you know, packed into this little area there um, on the uh, the walkway, you know, uh, near the South Lawn at the White House. So, yeah. In general, how often are you at the White House versus, you know, covering um, the the Hill or anything else that's in the D.C. metro area, both as a freelancer and as a staffer? What's the kind of the differences? But I want to hear both your sides of the story. We'll start with you, David. Right. So um, I was uh, when I first started working here, I was credentialed for Capitol Hill right away. So I was able to go anytime that that I wanted. And, you know, I found that it was really interesting to me because I'd never even really been there before. I've seen it working, you know, sort of seen how it how the daily kind of flow, what the, what that's like there. So, you know, their press conferences, uh, I would say almost every day or some kind of interesting hearing. So I was going like all the time. Um, a lot of time, you know, I wasn't on assignment. I was just kind of I was shooting on spec and I was trying to familiarize myself with the kind of what kind of access you have there and what the different opportunities uh, were. Um, and then it took me a while to get credentials for the White House. But once that happened, then I was kind of trying to go almost any time that I thought there'd be uh, a chance of seeing POTUS. So it might be a departure or it might be some other event that they were doing in the East Room. Um, and that's that's changed a lot since COVID, and we can get into that later, you know, I think. But, um, you know, more time on Capitol Hill just because there's more to do. You could you might go to the White House and, um, uh, you know, it wouldn't be that unusual not to even be able to see the president on a particular day, particularly if you're not in the in the, the, the White House in-house pool, which is a very it's a small group of journalists that are in that pool. Who will regularly get into the Oval Office for an event or do something else there? So, yeah. Okay, David. Graham. Oh, I'm saying Graham. Oh, Graham. Graham. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I would just agree with everything that Dave said there. Um, I I cover Capitol Hill predominantly, so I'm up there. Um, uh, you know, Monday through to Friday, um, if they're if they're in Friday, but. Uh, I, I've I've been covering that for uh, for years now, and uh, covering the hill is is definitely challenging. It's um, certainly now um, now that with this administration, you know, everything is everything is very much sort of up in the air, and we don't know. That there's so many things happening um, from hour to hour, day to day, that uh, it's 
it's it's um, very uh, very very challenging um, when you are working with so many other photographers and reporters now, because I remember um, earlier this year uh, we had this we had like people you know uh, uh, rope against ropes uh, or journalists because we had so many people trying to talk to senators or talk to members of Congress that it became an issue where the members would get uh, mobbed. <laughs> so uh, it was that was certainly challenging. Um, I go to the White House sometimes, um, and I, I do, you know, cover uh, departures. Uh, and it's like what Dave said: he comes out, he talks, um, and that's the opportunity to get him, um, unless you're the in-house pool. Um, and it's, um, and, but then again, you know, you might turn up there one day for a departure, and he won't talk at all, or an arrival. It just depends on. How he how he feels. So um, yeah, uh, but the the White House uh, is um, it's it's difficult just because that's really for me at least that's really the only opportunity to see POTUS. So uh, the pool obviously has more opportunities uh, when they're traveling with them that kind of thing. So I don't I don't get to do that. And, and, you know, also, occasionally POTUS, whoever it is, goes to Capitol Hill, you know, and those situations yeah. are, are, are pretty interesting, you know, because you see, you see that interaction, you see POTUS in a new place, which is, which is kind of cool, you know. Yeah. One of the things that, that I noticed when I started coming to Washington, and I, I mean, I kind of knew that it was going to be like this, but it is a little more, um, it, it, it kind of sinks in after you've been here for a few months. If there's there's a limited number of places where you you actually end up taking most of your pictures. I mean, if your focus is on Congress and the White House, and it's the people in Congress, it's the senators, and it's you know it's the members of in the House of Representatives. It's like well, you have hearing rooms, and then there's certain hallways that you end up photographing people. There are places where these you know these press conferences, the formal ones and the informal ones, happen. So. It's like, you know, you, you spread all these pictures out that you're doing over the course of weeks and you find it's like, okay, there's like 15 different rooms that I'm photographing in and that's kind of about it. So um, anytime there's like variation on that, it's great. You know, it's really because it, it's just something different. You know, the light's going to be different, the background, uh, you know, so that's, that's kind of what keeps you... Um, I think that's what you know, kind of gives you an injection of energy when there's when there's one of those more rare events, or you know, maybe uh, uh, well, uh, you know, a member of Congress uh, or senator has died, or like John McCain or something. There's going to be like a formal procession, you know, up the steps of the Capitol. Uh, there might be a funeral, let's say at the National Cathedral. So these are these are sort of like more unique opportunities uh, to get different kinds of pictures. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's, you know, one of the, the cool things about working in D.C., there's there's a lot of image variety besides, obviously, you know, the political stuff. And, you know, now with everything going on and, you know, protests, I think, you know, are, are they still ongoing? Are the, the protests still in D.C.? Are they still as fervent and ongoing as they have been? Yeah, there's there's uh, there, there was some protests still ongoing. In fact, there was um, some last night. So there are a few pockets of, of protesting that's going on downtown um still so yeah. uh yeah it's still ongoing um <clears throat> have either of you uh seen our uh, our regular co-host evelyn hockstein at or worked with her on anything uh recently i i don't think i have actually personally um I, I've never run into her. Have you, Dave? I, 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 I don't know her uh, personally. I, I, I've seen her. Like, I like. Oh, that's. I think I know who that is. But yeah. I, but I don't. I don't like. I haven't spoken with her because I, I don't know her. But yeah. I would hope you know her from the show. Be like, oh my goodness, the Evelyn Hochstein from Around the Lens. Could I have your autograph? Oh yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah. yeah. I think she will do that for you. Go, <laughs> go sell it on eBay. You know, you might yeah. make hey, some it's, money. Uh, it's, there's a lot of photographers in town here now. I remember when the last year of Obama, um, and there were nowhere near the number of freelancers there are now. Really? Uh, yeah, oh yeah. Why do you think uh, that is? Well, it's the it's it's the work. 
it's it's because um, you know, <clears throat> uh, the, well, certainly the last year of Obama, there wasn't really much work because there's nothing really happening. Right. Um, right. Whereas now, um, this there's there's so much going on with uh, photographing Trump going to rallies, and uh, you know, Obama never really sort of went out and did, did these rallies on a regular basis. So, um, and and just just this the, the so much going on in the news with members of Congress and uh, there's there's so much happened in the last four years the Me Too movement uh, we've had so many so many notable people uh, testifying before Congress um, that has been pretty full on uh, so I think that's why there's been a an influx of freelancers coming here to. Uh, to photograph what's going on here. So it, because of that, then, do you anticipate perhaps if there is a change in leadership that there would be a downturn in the amount of freelancers? Or do you think that the, the general interest and activity within D.C. and that area and what's going on within politics would maintain? I didn't quite you cut out there for a second. I didn't quite. What I'm saying is, do you think question. that do you think that the volume of freelancers would change if there was a new president or would it? You know, would it remain the same because there's more of a general interest in politics in general? I think there has been a gen- more of a general interest in politics. I mean, I, you know, I talked to my parents back home in New Zealand, and they, they know who Stephen Munchen is, and uh, a Treasury Secretary. And uh, you see, he gets the best ratings. Like, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, they 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 take a keen interest in what what is going on here now, whereas whereas during the Obama years. Everything was more sort of uh, they, they they knew what was going on, but they, but there wasn't as much drama, and there wasn't these people weren't sort of really so much in the spotlight. Um, so I think people are more tuned into this now, um, from what I can tell, than certainly certainly in the previous administration for sure. Uh, and they know they know that some of these key players in the administration, and and also. In, in Congress. It tends to be uh, when things are going smoothly, you just kind of go. With, that's the way government is. It just reacts, you know, and, and, and runs smoothly, and you don't have to pay attention to it every day. When it affects your life every day, and there's such a crazy, uh, volatile world going on, you pay more attention to it. So I, I think it's 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 the the state of politics at the moment that everybody's because uh, it's affecting everybody. It, you know, they want to see what's going to happen next. It's you know, it's it's uh, unfortunately like a car accident. You you drive by, but you have to look and you slow down and, and you check it out and. Uh, and uh, it's a very, very different world now. Yeah, and if you look at Twitter, um, Twitter <clears throat> prior to uh, uh, prior to Trump was actually not doing very well. Um, and now, uh, now Twitter is is uh, is thriving. You know, and you have uh, celebrities weighing in on politics now. You have everybody weighing in on this stuff. Yeah, I think um, it was Taylor Swift. First time she ever weighed in on politics was. Because right of issues in the past four years. Yeah, and I know Alicia Milano has, you know, has has always been involved in some way or another. But uh, I think these 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 uh, Twitter flame wars going on between these celebrities like Alicia Milano and what, Rose McGowan, and they used to work together or something. And and uh, yeah, that uh, that all started more more from the uh, Me Too movement and Harvey Weinstein. Okay, well, yeah, I mean that was. Yeah, so there you go. So there's, um, yeah, there's there's more, uh, and it's, you know, it can be. I don't spend a lot of time on Twitter, but as we all know, it can be. It's pretty ugly. So, uh, but there is certainly more uh, interest in what is going on here. So. Yeah, yeah. Now, what are you talking about? Twitter is a place with, you know, uh, well meter debate and discussion educated debate and discussion about all the topics and issues there's no vitriol or uh, but it's also it's 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 you know i mean twitter is what you what you cultivate i mean there, there are plenty of incredibly uh well articulate uh people putting stuff up there but if you're cultivating you know one type of person like on facebook then you're going to get what you what you kind of follow and what you you, you know so i mean there, it's it's on there it, there's the good and the bad yeah, and yeah, and, 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 and so much time on there. I um, I'm sort of, sort of my brain is kind of marinating in dopamine, mm. and <laughs> just just by all these, just refreshing this thing all the time, and I just have to sort of you know, tune out. And and you know, as you say, it's there are people on there who are 
putting interesting content uh, and interesting perspectives on Twitter. But then again, a lot of it is just, you know, <laughs> it's just uh, crazy stuff and silly, silly stuff that you just have to sort of try and filter out. Yeah. So. And, and, you know, and I, I think it really like changes the sense of what the news cycle is. I mean, you know, having, you know, just just like Graham, I mean, having started as a photojournalist bef before that, even for me, before the Internet, you know, it's like that the whole concept of what, you know, covering a news event and what might kind of change over the course of the day. Like if you, you know, you knew, let's say you knew something was going to be happening. You would think, OK, well, maybe one thing will happen on that day that'll be kind of a big deal. Right. And that people's concept of what a, a covering an event was going to be like was sort of based on at least what well, it's a whole day of just doing something. Whereas now, um you know, it could be every it could be every 10 minutes or it could be every half hour or whatever. It's like, you know, and reporters, when you're out there and you're you're working, you see that the reporters, you know, they're on they're on their phones basically nonstop. If they're not talking to an interview subject, then they're probably looking at their phones. And one of the things they're doing is looking at Twitter to see what subjects might be saying, to see what other journalists are talking about on there. So it's just a, it's like a continuous uh, cycle that just never it just never stops yeah it never ends. Um, it's, it's really different you know and it i think it kind of like it can impact the way you uh see your job as a photojournalist it's like instead of thinking oh what's what's the big deal this week or this day it's like oh what's happening you know on this hour and that your whole concept of what you're doing can be impacted by the idea of getting getting a picture right away and getting that out like Steve Mnuchin says something that's, you know, a lot of people are talking about. And then you think, oh, I've got to have a picture of Steve Mnuchin right now. So, I mean, um, I, I, I'm sort of less impacted by that kind of flow. But I think, you know, it just it's a reality. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Dave, just so you're aware, your microphone is, is touching oh, your shirt oh, a little sorry, bit. Man. Just, yeah, just right. give me a heads up. Um, absolutely. No, absolutely. You bring, I think you bring up some good points. I think Twitter is is more important now than ever, and social media in general is more important now than ever in terms of being on it and being actively engaged on it. Uh, you know, do either of you engage? I mean, obviously, besides reading Twitter and paying attention to it, you know, are you using it as a platform? I couldn't to disagree cultivate? with you more, David. <laughs> Honestly, I, know, right? I really couldn't. Instagram, that's really where it's couldn't. at. No, I think it's 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 the cause for why we're in a lot of the predicament we're in, and uh, for false information, especially Facebook and, and Russian trolling and uh, and bots and all that kind of stuff. I think it's it, it's it's created uh, a lot of the the fractioning and tribalism in the country, and uh, it's the leading cause for what uh, a lot of the problems are going on. How do we fix it, Travis? You kill Facebook. <laughs> No, there there has to be some policing of, of facts and or you know it's it's like you know when when uh, Zuckerberg comes out and says who do the you last marry? Week, you know what's that? Who do you marry and who do you f? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Did you kill Facebook. But when he says you know we're going to pull you know we're not going to let them put new Facebook ads uh, you know for political things the last week that's it's ridiculous. It's a non-entity. It's like they'll just stack up the ads the you know eight days before instead of seven days before. It's just it's just you know there there has to be you know when you see all these very blatant blatant you know uh you know false stories you know especially when you're looking at QAnon and stuff like that you know people are thinking like you know the leftists are now you know cannibalizing you know babies and stealing them and drinking the blood for you know just like and there's a large scary portion of America that's starting to pick up on QAnon and it's traveling to places like Germany and stuff like that and when you hear that uh, there are people in Germany and you know and the protest uh, quoting QAnon, I think that's frightening <laughs> that it's spread from you know USA to you know, across. And so so it, I think there has to be a certain amount of responsibility of you know just putting some sort of uh, rating or disclaimer to, to things online so people can say oh well maybe it's not true or maybe it is true or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, let me ask you, Graham. Obviously, you have your ties to New Zealand. What's kind of New Zealand stance on everything? You know, COVID. Uh, you know, everything going on in the United States. Is there is there much sort of paying attention, or is it just basically ignoring it? I I think they are paying attention. Uh, um, <clears throat> in fact, uh, well, we have a New Zealand uh, where it was three months without COVID for for which is no, actually it was hundred hundred days without coronavirus, um, and then it came back, and I don't really know how it came back. Um, it just popped up one one particular family and they all had it and I now, think it's some spring breakers from America went there. 
<laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, how is how is New Zealand doing with COVID? Have they been able to handle it pretty well? I think he froze on us. Yeah, pretty well. The the the, the well, you know, we have okay. a very small population, just I think four million people. So um, so tracing is uh, easier, I think, um, and the ma majority of the the, uh, the cases are in Auckland, which is where I'm from. So, uh, but. The New Zealand's lockdowns are pretty strict. You know, they actually put roadblocks in place. Wow. So people can't, yeah, they, they can't leave um, their their town. Uh, so so they, they really do try and uh, contain it. Um, and the last time they did it before this other, this previous new breakout, I should say, um, it was very successful because we essentially got rid of it for 100 days. Sure. But... Uh, yeah, but it came back, um, yeah. and I don't know exactly how, but uh, I would suspect it came through um, on a on a flight. That's the only way I can think of how it came came back. But uh, so, um, but New Zealand has been, you know, Trump mentioned New Zealand um, in one of his uh, at one of his rallies. He said that. Uh, New Zealand had the coronavirus again, and and it was I I'm not, I don't know his exact quote, but he said that it was it was uh, very bad and out of out of control or something like that. I don't I don't exact quote, but uh, but then the New Zealand Prime Minister uh, responded back and said that uh, the New Zealand's actually doing a really good job of trying to contain um, the uh, the coronavirus, and we had a we had a death um, I think uh, last. Maybe a few days ago. So the total number of deaths in New Zealand is now 24. Hmm. So, um, yeah. And, and I think the majority majority of those people um, have been el elderly or been in, um, in uh, retirement homes. Yeah. So, and I'm assuming, uh, you know, working as a staff photographer for the for a, a newspaper for a, you know a, a publication how has has your publication sort of reacted to covid you know in in with regard to how you work you know has it affected how you work or is it sort of normalized oh it's affected it's, it's affected me hugely um i've had to you know i i've like a lot of other photojournalists in town here i've had to go and get uh coronavirus tests um, I, certainly after the protests, the, the, those first protests, uh, we had to go, I mean, I had to go and get tested because I was amongst all these people. Some of them weren't wearing masks. Uh, yeah, I think when we had Evelyn, you know, talking about her experiences, you know, she had mentioned basically that all those sort of social distance and mask protocols kind of go out the window when you're in the heat of covering a, a protest, you're sort of in the thick of it and people are yelling and it's just, you kind of, yeah, you kind of have no really, choice. Yeah, so when you get, really, when you get really that, tough. uh, you get the, uh, the, the memo or you, yeah, you have to cover it. Like I have to cover a Trump rally. Uh, does your heart sink a little bit? <laughs> like with, <laughs> Oh, I'm going to have to go into the crowds. No mask. No, not like, you know, they're not wearing masks. Like, a, do you prep yourself differently? Do you like it, it, What's, what's the thought process when you like something like that happens or do you cover any of that? Well, um, it's been a while. I don't really cover many Trump rallies. It's certainly not, not now because, uh, that's mostly covered by the pool. Um, okay. but I have it, I have covered, uh, um, the last one I did was when he went to Pennsylvania. Um, uh, oh, I think we uh, froze on us. We froze on us. Well, we'll throw it over to you, David. I mean, the last time we talked was over a year and a half ago, and you know He's you. Back. Okay. You want Graham? We lost you for a second. Do you want to continue on? We lost you on that answer of uh, the Pennsylvania. Oh, sorry. No worries. Yeah. Um, yeah, he uh, he was visiting a factory, uh, and and uh, which would made uh, N95 masks, and right. uh, so there were people who were working there, and they spread the chairs out, and they were all wearing masks, and uh, he wasn't Trump wasn't wearing a mask at the time, but uh, it was quite surreal, really. Um, the, all these people, this, the chairs all separated, spread out in this giant warehouse, and they're all wearing. Uh, uh, well, dis disposable medical 
uh, masks. So it was, it was pretty interesting. But I, I. <laughs> oh my goodness! Love the internet. Mm. Um, mm. While we let Graham um, buffer, oh there he is. Okay, Graham, we lost <laughs> you there. <laughs> Sorry. Just on the very um, last part. <laughs> yeah, the last part of that. Uh, I, I, I was just saying that um, whenever I cover any of these uh, rallies or protests or anything like that, um, it is very difficult to do any social distancing at all. Yeah. Um, and all you can do really is just keep your mask on and kind of just hope that you're going to be okay. <laughs> really. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. Um, you have to be there and you have to, you have to photograph what's going on. And sometimes you're in the midst of your, your elbow to elbow with people, with protesters, with other photographers. Um, and I had, uh, we lost David. Well, let me throw it over to David. Uh, you know, again, your, last time we had you on was a year and a half ago, and that was, of course, you know, the before times back when people could, you know, touch each other with handshakes and, you know, getting within six feet of one another. How has your life changed, and also how has covering just DC area whatnot um, changed since the you know since COVID has sort of taken hold? Sure, it's it's changed a lot. It really has. I, you know, just in general, my uh, assignment rate has gone down because a lot of the things I'm doing uh, are events. You know, gatherings of people that are scheduled. They're either corporate events or political events or something like that. So obviously, that's that's like hardly happening at all right now. Um, and then uh, the you know the access in Washington to the political stuff has changed as well. I mean, Capitol Hill now is. Uh, there, there are, you can you can still go if you have a, a credential for the Hill, but there are much fewer journalists uh, than there usually are. So, you know, you kind of have to have, um, I think, you know, sort of the the expectation is that you're there for a specific reason. Maybe you've got a specific assignment. So just, you know, I, I just tend not to do that as much or, you know, go on spec uh, like I used to. And then the White House has changed a lot because it used to be, Anybody who was credentialed for the White House could get in there at any time. It didn't mean they would have necessarily photo access to POTUS, but you could actually get on to the White House grounds and, and get into the press area there. But uh, you can't right now unless you're in the pool or unless you've had an assignment. So, I I mean, fortunately, uh, sorry if the story is not that interesting. Oh, today, but, uh, it's, no, okay, it's, for everybody's uh, context, it's after, it's almost 11 p.m. here in Korea, all right? So yeah, a, just so everyone knows, it's always late yeah. for me. It's always early for everyone else who's on the show. Just putting that out there. You know, your story is very interesting. Thank you. Please go on. Yeah, no, that's, Have you that's watched it. any of these, Dave? Yawns every single episode. It's not. True. I had one episode. I had one episode where I didn't yawn the whole time. I was very proud of myself. I let Travis know that after the show, I was like, Travis. So, excuse me. I raised two two small kids, and I have a full time job. But you know, anyways, please, David, go on. The military. <laughs> Sorry, Indeed. I didn't didn't mean to you know bring it up. That's okay. That's Josh and because you know I, I do have a tendency to drone on sometimes. So, no, you're you know, fine. I'm used to people getting. But ne um, next time I yawn, I'll just go like this. <laughs> you can just freeze yourself in that. Um, when you when you see this, that's when you know. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Whoa! Oh, there it is. Right. Okay. I'll just turn uh, off my camera. The camera goes off. You know we're we're doing something else. <laughs> I mute the microphone. Turn off the camera. Anyways, I'm sorry. Go ahead, David. No, that's okay. Um, so you know. Um, it, so I've, I've, I've had uh, a couple of appointments, you know, since COVID started at the White House. So, you know, I was I was able to get in on those occasions. But um, but, yeah, it's like that normal kind of access that, you know, that I was used to just don't uh, you know, I don't I don't have that anymore. And, you know, I definitely, you know, uh, everything that Graham was telling you about with covering these protests, I mean, you're certainly you're aware of that, you know, it's very crowded. And I mean, I got to say that most of the, um, you know, the protests that began after George Floyd, you'd have hundreds of people out there on the streets, but almost everyone was wearing a mask. Yeah. So at least you did, you know, at least you feel like people are trying to be, you know, as responsible as possible in that circumstance. Yeah. Um, um, but, 
Yeah. So, and I, I, I personally haven't been to any Trump rallies. I don't think since COVID started. So I haven't had that worry about being in a crowd where people don't feel like wearing masks, you know, or they're trying to make a statement by not wearing one. Yeah. You know, but that would kind of freak me out. Definitely. Yeah. Graham, yeah. you mentioned testing, and I'm, I'm curious for both of you. Have both of you been tested? Oh, you, uh, you just cut there for a second. Graham, you mentioned testing. Have both of you been tested for coronavirus? Sounds like Graham said multiple times. <laughs> uh, four times. Four times. Wow. David, you? Yeah, I've been tested every every time I've had to do something at the White House. I mean, I have uh, had a couple of uh, kind of like one on one uh, interview portrait type uh, shoots with uh, with Trump. Um, and so, yeah, you have you, you have to get tested. Oh, as, yeah. As part Absolutely. of that. Yeah. And, and I went up to West Point to photograph him when he uh, spoke to the graduating class up there in the yeah. late late spring so yeah so so mm -hmm. both of you have been tested multiple times does mm -hmm. getting the swab stuck to the back of your throat and the back of your your nos nasal cavity nasal get any cavity. easier get any easier with multiple tests or is it just always horrible every time uh well, it you know depends <laughs> you go, go ahead Graham. okay um it depends uh for, for me uh, from my experience anyway because um uh I went. To, I was at my doctor's office to get one, and the nurse in there, she said, "Well, I've done this hundreds of times, so it should it should be okay. You shouldn't feel too much discomfort." And she did a really good job. You know, she did the, you know, what I call the brain swab, mm -hmm. um, where it, it goes all the way up, and you kind of think, "Well, you know, that's really." Um, but uh, in, and I, it, 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 I didn't have too much discomfort. Another time, I went to. Uh, um, <clears throat> Uh, a, a clinic just in, in Virginia here and uh, the the nurse walks out because you don't get when you're just in your car and they swab you when you're in your car and it was like well, you know, I said my eyes were watering because uh, uh, she was really sort of digging in there um, so uh, yeah I mean it just it just I guess it just depends on the uh, who, who's doing it but um, <clears throat> And there's there's the there's that swab and, and then there's then there's uh, just the regular Q-tip kind of swab where they just do it sort of like you know not not so far up your nose and then there's the the saliva test mm -hmm. um, which I'm not sure how accurate that is um, uh, and then there's the antibody test yeah so. yeah for what I know is each of those tests have le um, lower and lower levels of accuracy so the less invasive it is the less accurate it is but you know, again, in terms of speed and what you're trying to get out of it, you know, less accurate and sometimes better if you're trying to get something very quickly. But, um, yeah, the mm -hmm. one in the, the back of your nos no nasal cavity is the most accurate. You know, you know yeah. as someone who works as a staff photographer, you're obviously in the office right now. You go into the office, I'm assuming, pretty regularly. I mean, does do you have to get tested before you go into the office or is it basically like – there's a general bubble there of trust, you know, from everyone who works there, or is everybody kind of, you know, working from home? Uh, well, most people in my office, uh, they're working from home. Um, uh, they're reporters, so they can they can just sit up their computer at home and do everything from there. Um, and and any of these uh, conferences or meetings that they would normally attend at a particular event are now all just done virtually. So they don't even have to leave the, the kitchen, you know? Yeah. Um, whereas me and David, photographers, we have to, we can't be at home. We have to leave and we have to leave the house and we have to go out and be amongst it. Um, so, uh, but yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's the thing. Is, is there any precautions when you go back into the office or does it not matter because everyone's working from home? Uh, no, so we have we have protocol. We have to wear wear a mask, and I'm not wearing it now, but cause I'm talking. But um, right. when you're when you're uh, when you're in the office and you're and walking around, you have to wear a mask. Um, <clears throat> and we have hand sanitizer everywhere. There's only one mm -hmm. person who goes to the bathroom at any one time. Yeah, uh, and that kind of thing. So it's uh, they have our office has uh, protocol in place. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. And I'm sure the same thing at your house, David, right? You have to have the hand sanitizer and then the mask wearer. No, I'm just kidding. 
Oh yeah, I have it right by the doorway. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Cool. Cool. Uh, you know, I was gonna say like you know you're one of the rare staff photographers we have on the show, uh, Graham. You know, it's obviously there aren't as many as there used to be. Um, you know, how do you feel? You know, being a staff photographer. You know, and how has it been for you and sort of seeing sort of the decline of the staff photographer as a job position sort of contract in many news organizations. You know, what has it been like from your perspective? Uh, yeah, I, I guess that uh, it is a uh, perhaps a, a dying profession. Maybe the staff photographer is uh, is something that um, unless you're a wire photographer, most most uh, magazines or most sm- other smaller um, outlets don't have staff photographers, or they they just you know hire freelancers. So. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting and it's sad also at the same time. You know, uh, I know there's been a lot of newspapers over the over the years that have just gotten rid of their photographers. Uh, the Washington Times um, uh, got rid of all their photographers a few years ago. They had uh, at one point they had about five, and I know the photographer who was the last guy there, and they you know they just laid him off, and now they just use the wires. So. Um, yeah, that's that's very unfortunate, um, and uh, it's very sad to see. But um, but then you know the the freelancers they become freelancers, and then it's because there's more competition amongst the freelancers to get that work. Yeah. Uh, so um, have you seen a lot yeah. of people leave the career field because of it? Like if they can't, you know, they don't want to be a freelancer because there's a billion freelancers and they can't be a staffer because nobody's hiring staffers. So they just go find other things to do or they do weddings or oh, just do something know, completely outside of the career field. Yeah, I know. I know. If, yeah, I know a few people have done that. I know one one uh, one guy who actually went back to college and uh, to get his uh, master's degree. He was like, OK, um, this is this is really really difficult right now and I, I'm not getting any work so I'm just going to go and do something else I'm going to go back to college yeah. and uh, maybe maybe pursue something else you know um, I know other photographers who um, have taken uh, one, one photographer I know who who went to work for the government wow. has just decided to uh, decided to you know this isn't for me anymore and just decided to go work for the government. So yeah, there, there are people who, who have left. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly tough. I mean, I, I know, um, Dave's got some great stories about the good old days where there were, you know, un- seemingly unlimited budgets for magazines and newspapers and you can go to places and, you know, spend as much time as you want. But of course now, um, that's just not the reality. So yeah, absolutely. Well, hopefully, uh, I mean, you know, I was going to say, hopefully there's a resurgence, but I, do you ever see, do you think that there, there'll ever be a resurgence in staff photography or you think it's kind of, it is what it is? I don't know. Um, like hard there, to say. No, rena- no, no renaissance or, well, I guess we already had a renaissance and our golden age, but I guess a resurgence. Yeah, but. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. So many things are, are just basically, are just online now. Yeah. Um, a lot of publications are purely online. There's yeah. no print format. Um, I know the Washington Post recently. They've been making hires. They hired a, another photographer just recently. Oh, that's good. Uh, yeah. Um, so, and uh, the I'm wires, sure they only got a few applications as well. I'm sure there weren't too many people applying <laughs> right, for that yeah. job. I'm sure they <laughs> maybe just a hand. <laughs> uh, but uh, the wire services. Um, you know they've hired more people here in DC. We have we've had a few few uh, staffers uh, from the wire services who have, who, who not, yeah not that many, but a few have left. But uh, yeah, we, they're hiring and hiring people for staff jobs. The wire the wire services. Yeah. So okay, um, that's good. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's not it's not what it used to be. Yeah. All right, well, let's shift away from that depressing aspect of our career field and talk. Uh, let's get uh, a little geeky about gear. Um, Panasonic just dropped their can, uh, their S5 camera. It's their latest sort of budget full-frame 
mirrorless camera. It can shoot uh, 4K 60 and 4K 30. It has a 24 megapixel sensor. It's only $2,000. So it puts it on par with like the Sony a7 III and some of those cameras like the, the Canon R6, a little bit less expensive than that. So a lot of capability there and probably a lot of interest to those people who are kind of moving more towards the video shooting side. Uh, I think if I were not already on board with Canon again, having switched to the Canon R5, I would definitely consider it as an upgrade from my GH5 just because, you know, I love micro four thirds. I love what Panasonic does with the GH series, but full frame is where it's at in a lot of ways. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about my uh, sort of feelings about the Canon R5 in a minute, but uh, let's go around and talk what we're working with. Uh, Dave, what's your camera choice? So, uh, yeah, so I, I'm uh, a rangefinder guy. I mean, I use mirrorless cameras as well, and I've used DSLRs up until pretty recently, but uh, I started working with Leica rangefinders, yeah. you know, M6s in the 90s, and I just, I loved them, and I, I, I felt like I did most of my best work just using those, you know, one or two of those cameras with a couple of, uh, you know, prime lenses, obviously. And uh, so I didn't, once digital became the predominant thing, you know, I, I stopped using those. But now that Leica is kind of back in the game, you know, and they have very good full frame digital cameras, I'm, I'm really happy to, to use their stuff again, you know, to be able yeah. to work that way. So, yeah, for sure. Cool. Yeah, cool. They, I've seen now. Uh, uh, some amazing stuff off the Leica. It's just such a powerful, great, great camera. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's really like just there's there's nothing like uh, uh, the rangefinder just in terms of how you how you see and how you end up working. You know, it's not just that it's smaller, but there's something about that clear finder. You know, I just I end up seeing things differently, and I I usually it just seems like my there's something about the process that kind of it has an impact on the way I shoot. And I, I like the impact that it has. So I, I can't use those cameras exclusively because there's other stuff. You know, I need zoom lenses for, you know, when I'm shooting at a distance, obviously. Right. But, uh, you know, when I can get up close, that's definitely what I like to use. Yeah. Yeah. I, just, I just thought of a great slogan Leica can use for their next advertising campaign. If anyone oh, from no. Leica is listening, here it goes. There's nothing like a Leica. There's nothing like a Leica. Okay. I, I think they, they may have, they have, they they may have passed that across the desk before. Okay. I don't know if they've used mm. it, but someone someone went, yeah, no. <laughs> There's nothing like a Leica. Anyways. I like a Leica. Leica. I like a Leica <laughs> a lot. Mm. I like Okay. Hello, jingle writers. I know. Aging, that that, aging that we're not. <laughs> yeah. I can get away with it. I'm a dad, so. Um, there you go. Yeah, Leica, Leica is doing some great stuff. I haven't really followed them recently and, and don't know what they're doing in the video space, but I know they've, you know, they create great still cameras. I just had a, a long talk with uh, Phil Penman. I don't know if you guys know uh, Phil Penman, but uh, he, he is one of the Leica shooters, and uh, but uh, off, off a street photographer and a journalist and stuff like that. And uh, there's a certain look to his um, black and white photography that obviously it, it just it, it screams Leica, and mm -hmm. it's it's absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. And his work is beautiful as well. But uh, to him, he, that's, that's pretty much what he exclusively uses. Nice. As a Leica person, does he pay attention to what's going on with the other manufacturers? And does he have any? Did he have any comments about what you know, Canon and Nikon and all the other folks? Oh, are doing? I, think, I mean, I think the main thing is like everybody's putting a good camera out nowadays. I yeah. mean, if you want to shoot, you're you're go, you're <clears throat> you're not just buying into a certain like, you know. You're buying into a company, an ecosystem, uh, a community. So it really, you, you kind of have to figure what's good for you. You know, if, if you if you feel like the Fuji is really kind of feels like that old school, like I'm going to go out and I can set everything before turning on my camera, and I, I like this kind of street photographer, old school community. That's great. If you want Sony, which is kind of this innovative technology and kind of uh, be alpha, go out and uh, seize the day with you know fast uh, cameras and 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 do stuff. Is that's a different thing. Canon has its you know built in audio. It's like everybody builds a good camera nowadays. It's really kind of what you want besides just the camera. You want the community with the lenses, what you're going to shoot. So, I mean, it's really geared to like when someone says, oh, what camera should I get? As well, if there was one camera to get, you know, there would only be one camera company. But since we all shoot differently, we all like different things, there's tons of different cameras. So you really have to say, what do you shoot? What do you like? What do you, what's, what's your interest? And then you kind of decide what uh, ecosystem you want to join into. Yeah, that's one of my that's one of the things I love most about Sony is their 
commitment to the audience, commitment to the users, the culture, like you said, the B alpha thing. Like there is no, like, I, you know, I didn't get a, a membership card to any sort of club when I bought my Canon. I'm just kind of, you know, we can't, we, we, uh, you know, communicate and sort of conglomerate or whatever, you know, via our own Facebook groups and whatnot. But they're, yeah, I like what Sony's doing there. A lot of yeah. other manufacturers could learn from what they're doing for sure. Um, over there in uh, the Examiner, I know they're using Canon, or you're using Canon, right? Yeah. Um, I, I, well, I've been using Canon since I was um, 16 years old, so okay. uh, I haven't deviated. Um, I have I have used uh, Nikon's and, 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 and Sony's, the, the recent <clears throat> Sony A9, and uh, yeah, the, the, the mirrorless cameras, um, I'm pretty new to the mirrorless cameras, I, I've just started using them in the last um the last couple of years and uh yeah they certainly have certainly have I would assume it's sort of a game changer with uh you know when you're shooting in you know in the white house and stuff like that and you need to silence uh you know your camera now that you don't have to put it in you know this contraption to silence it that is truly a silent camera being pivotal okay. oh there we go uh, <laughs> there's a quick pause Are we okay? we're back okay yeah, you, you guys paused as well. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's it, the the mirrorless uh, revolution, as they call it. It certainly has been been pivotal because, uh, as we all know, AP have completely changed changed system and they've gone to uh, Sony and and they even they've said like you know we can we can shoot silently now and so it, you know. There's, there's less of a distraction when there's a big there's a photographer there with his big camera making loud clicking noises. Um, that that certainly has uh, changed things a lot. And and even you know when on Capitol Hill, I remember uh, Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker. She uh, uh, yeah, we dropped out there, but I'm assuming the day that she said uh, only silent cameras could be shot for this one announcement. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And um, right. Exactly. So we were all thinking, well, wow, this, what is this? You know, um, this is, this is kind of strange. And, and uh, we're thinking, well, you know, we've been, we've been using these cameras and cameras have been making clicking noises for 70 years. Mm -hmm. Why do we, <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden a thing now. And uh, so that, so what that means is uh, everybody out there, now knows that there are cameras out there. Not photographers, but they know that these are cameras out there that don't make any noise. Yeah. Um, so that's the thing now, and so that that was another moment where all the photographers were like, "Well, I guess we're all going to start using mirrorless cameras now because is that <laughs> going to be going to happen again? Are we going to?" Uh... Yeah, and I mean the thing is, you know, you got your choice no matter what type of camera you use you've got a mirrorless for that you know now i mean every single system and every single shooter has a mirrorless option um so are you shooting canon mirrorless you said you, i think you're shooting the r or the r5 r5 you got yeah. hands on. is that the yeah, official yeah. camera of your of your organization is canon kind of sponsored uh your organization no, no not no. um no <laughs> um <laughs> i just choose <laughs> i just choose to use it um but uh, yeah, I mean, and and it's it's been very good. It's um, I, certainly when I first started using uh, silent cameras, the A nine, uh, the the fact that there was no noise was a little bit odd to me because <laughs> yeah. I wanted, at, um, I needed my brain was you need like, verification oh. that it took the picture. Sometimes you just don't. Yeah. It's like it did. Is it actually there? No, I understand it. Like uh, I started using it on behind the scenes, uh, you know, uh, on BTS on film sets and stuff like that. And, and when you're shooting next to the camera person, you know, and the sound person, it's great because they don't care and stuff like that. But when you actually have to go off and maybe shoot a portrait of an actor or something, when it doesn't have that sound, they're like, "Are you shooting?" And they get kind of so you have to turn it back to mechanical so they hear that sound and it gives them a comfort, you know, just to have that interaction of that sound. And when it wasn't there, they kind of freaked out like are you shooting is it video is it well it's okay so you know it was, it's very strange yeah that you need it sometimes and not need it it's sort of like you know getting a prius you know it's like you can't hear it coming and it scares the hell out of you so they've you know put these little beeping sounds like golf carts so you know it's coming <laughs> yeah i mean uh, that that's true it, it's uh it really is like that and it, it changes the whole 
the dynamic of things with your subjects. Um, certainly with, with photographing portraits, you know, they, like you say, they, they're sort of like, well, I don't know, you know, shall I sort of talk to this person over here while you're setting up? Are you doing anything or, or <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, um, you'd be I like, oh, we're done. We're done. I did the whole thing. You didn't realize. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Got some great yeah, natural so shots. So... <laughs> um, yeah, it, 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 it definitely is, um, is different, but I like, like we were talking about before. Um, it, I, it took some time getting used to it because my brain was like, well, what am I really getting here? I don't, I, the, the sound was like, okay, I, I, I got that picture. I'm pretty sure. But, you know, when you're shooting at 20 frames a second or whatever it is, yeah, um, it's just like, well, I think I got I got most of what happened there. I just don't know what exactly. But then you go back and edit, you know, with millions of frames. But <clears throat> but I don't I don't I'm not used to shooting 20 frames a second. I, I uh, quite often shoot mechanical on that camera just because um I, I'm just not used to shooting at that such a high frame. You know, uh, you said you have the R5. You've had it for a few weeks now. Uh, I got the R5 recently just this past uh, weekend, and so I've been shooting it with it for a few days. But I put out a video uh, a few weeks ago, probably about, not sure, about a, month, a few months ago now, um, where I posited about the kind of idea of using it as your, your sole video stills camera in that, you know, because you can shoot 8K, you can now grab a 33 megapixel still from any frame of 8K footage. You know, you don't even really need to, to shoot photos anymore because, I mean, 33 megapixels is, you know, extremely usable for a many, many purposes, especially when most people are looking at the news or your content on their phone. Has that some been something you've explored at all? Or, you know, again, just shooting 8K at an event and then pulling stills, or is it always going to be traditional? Um, here's a still shooter. I'm going to shoot stills only. Uh, is that for me? Or yeah, you're the other Canon R5 user in the group. So, huh. well, I have uh, maybe Graham is frozen out. So let me ask a question. So yeah, because I've been I've been reading about that. But if you're shooting 8K on a camera like that, what is the what is the high shutter speed limit what's the sh highest shutter speed that you can use for that i mean you know? it's, it's just like a stills camera you know you can you can yeah. adjust it to as high as you want so, um, which is going to affect your video it'll affect your, the look of your video and it'll affect right. uh, you know that that kind yeah. of that uh, seamless uh, you know you want, instead of shooting at 24 frames per second it's going to have that effect if you're shooting at 120 or if you're shooting at 6000 or something like that it's definitely going to have an effect um, well, so uh, and also you're you're limiting your light and video which you know you, you're trying not to do yeah. <laughs> a lot of the times you know so uh, so yeah it, it definitely has its challenges well, yeah, because I mean, if you're shooting, um, I, I mean, it, it seems like if you're shooting something that's moving quickly, right? I mean, you, um, y your video is, is it's just going to look a lot. It's going to look choppy, right? I mean, if you're shooting at a thousandth of a second, so yeah. it's almost like you still have to make that choice. Or I'm not sure. I mean, I'm I'm asking you guys yeah. to know more about this, but yeah, no, you're going to get a staccato style look if you're shooting at a higher shutter speed, or frame rate no shutter speed yeah if you're shooting it at like a thousandth of a second you are going to get that but you need that sometimes if you want to control motion blur for sure and you know ultimately that's going to be a trade-off right there you know do you want to be able to pull from stills and have a little bit more kind of choppier looking video or do you want more like natural looking video but you know again depending on what you're shooting right if you're shooting a very high intensity high action event then yeah you, you, you know you're going to get stuck with it no matter what but if you're shooting two people sitting or a podium event or something like that Somebody's talking to the camera. I mean, you can easily pull a still. Yeah, I mean, well, even you know, it's interesting. Like, I, I didn't realize this until I until I came to Washington, uh, where where a lot of what you're doing is you're you're photographing people at a podium when they're talking. And I would like sometimes, uh, you know, because I, I I come from like the slide film days or whatever, where you've got these really low. ASAs, if anybody even remembers what that is today, it's <laughs> ISO. But like, so you know, I'm I'm used to shooting at like you know 200 ASA or 200 ISO, mm -hmm. where you need a shutter speed of like 125th or something. So that's not a big deal to me to you know to sh you know shoot a lower shutter speed. But you know, I would look down at the at the cameras of of the other photographers around me. You know, when I'm shooting here in Washington and 
people, you know, even if you're shooting somebody at a podium, you might be cranked up to, let's say, one five hundredth of a second, you know, so that your every frame is going to be sharp. Yeah. So that, you know, if somebody's moving and they're turning, whereas, so I think you still, yeah, it's, it's not like you can shoot both video and stills at the same time and have the same quality, right, that you would get if you yeah. were picking one or the other, as far as I know, right, because... You know, no nobody shoots pro video at a thousandth of a second unless you're like, you know, shooting a golfer, you know, and you're trying to demonstrate what their form is or something like that, right? I mean, it just looks yeah. weird. Yeah. I mean, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So it's you, it's sixtieth of a second or whatever. You know, there's a lot of stuff that's going to be blurry in a yeah. still. So just making a plug. You know, don't don't fire the still photographers. You know, <laughs> you can't the video photographers not going to be able to right. do everything. Yeah. <laughs> Grant, have you tried that or have you just mostly shot stills with your R5? No, I I just shoot stills because I I want to be in control of what I'm thinking about photographing. I I I want to be deliberate in terms of what He wants to be deliberate. That's good. <laughs> Well, he he is deliberate. That is his style. If you look at his there pictures, they don't look the like definitive other, statement you know, on it. Yeah. Well, you know, they you know, his you know, we we go to these events here in Washington, you've got 20 photographers shooting exactly the same thing. Right. And like you look at Graham's pictures and they look different from everybody else's pictures. I mean, yeah. the way he's noticing light and the way he's uh, just composing and he he is much more deliberate. He doesn't he's not a 20 frames per second like just hold the button down kind of photographer so yeah. spray and pray yeah uh, <laughs> i yeah i've never really been like sort of uh just blasted and 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 hope that i'll get something i mean you will because with these cameras now you will you'll, you've got you know eyeball detection and and uh and that kind of thing so but uh i'm always i've, I've always got something uh in my i'm always looking for something specific um uh, so that's that's why I wouldn't really just switch to to, to video and just uh, frame grab because um, I'm I'm going into a I'm going into a room or I'm going into a situation where I'm really looking for something specific. Yeah. Um, just by judging the room and judging the the person who's talking or what kind of personality they have, what I know about them. Um, and that happens in hearings, uh, uh, as well, or you know anything where you you know this what this person is about, what their background is. Uh, I go in there and I think, well, I want to get this kind, of, I want to get this kind of photo of that yeah. person. Um, so, and uh, that's that's the challenge certainly when you're restricted in movement, mm -hmm. uh, where you can where you can stand. Uh, certainly now with the social distancing and certainly covering a hearing, I, I have to uh, do, I have pull duty on the hill. Uh, and uh, so two photographers cover a hearing and it's, it'll either be me and AFP. And then the following day, it might be the Washington post and, and uh, uh, EPA. Um, so we go in there and, and just send all the pictures out. But, uh, because of, because a lot of these members are not even there, they're on the Zoom call. There's only a few members inside the, the room sitting at the dais, and and sometimes not even the, the witnesses there. I mean, I, I photographed a hearing recently. Uh, it was a tech hearing where uh, <clears throat> uh, Zuckerberg, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, was testifying, and uh, the CEO from uh, Amazon. Um, Jeff Bezos and and uh, Steve Cook, but they were none of them were there. Um, so you you really have to you really have to think about how to shoot something like that. Um, I think you meant Tim Cook, right? Sorry, Tim Cook. Yeah, I should, sorry about okay. that. Um, and uh, you really got to sort of think hard about how you're going to photograph that because it could be, you know, you could it's, it, it could be you could make it look like incredibly boring. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, no, I, I, you know, I agree. I mean, you, you both raised up some very important points, and I think that things I wasn't really considering is is probably in depthly, probably just because I haven't used the camera in that situation, right? I mean, I was talking more from a theoretical perspective, you know, when I sort of did my commentary, but you know, hearing you guys talk about it, yeah, I mean, those those are definitely present some trade offs that you would have from that type of shooting style where you're, you know, you have to adjust for how you're shooting. But again, I thought from a a general user's perspective, there might be more benefit, like as a freelancer, right? You have your video th clips you can sell to the video networks and, and maybe make some money that way. And then you can grab your stills and throw it over to the uh, to the wire and maybe get some money that way. So I was thinking more from like the freelancer's perspective, where again, you're sort of the, the jack of all trades and you're your own self-contained unit. But um, from using the camera over this past weekend, I shot a bunch of 8K footage, right, to kind of test that out. And I would say the biggest hurdle to that type of kind of potential use case is workflow. And if you don't have a very robust, very large solid state hard drive to work off of, you're just going to be so incredibly slow that you cannot possibly keep up with the news cycle when shooting and trying to, you know, export in 8K. Uh, like I was using it. Um, over the weekend, like I said, and you have to have a solid state hard drive to dump your footage to a big enough solid state hard drive because I've got a 512 gigabyte CF express card that I shoot in the thing and I shot 8k for, you know, probably about maybe 20 minutes or so and it was like 370 gigabytes worth of data. And I'm, I'm pushing all that to the, you know, uh, solid state hard drive. And it's not that actually difficult to edit, I would say, for my system. But then I've got a 2080 Ti with an i9090X. It's, it's a top of the line PC, right? It wasn't that difficult to edit the footage. But again, just having to move it and store it. And it's just, you know, if I'm like a day to day news videographer, right, broadcaster, I'm probably shooting in 1080p because that's the fastest way to get it out to the stations, right? You don't want to, you know, no fuss, no muss, and plus they're going to be showing it in 1080 for the most part. So I'm sure many broadcasters don't even shoot in 4K if I were to, you know, take a guess at that. Uh, but yeah, that was the biggest thing. It's just the workflow and dealing with the footage and the file size. I mean, even shooting 45 megapixel stills, I mean, do you shoot raw um, with that, um, Graham, or are you shooting JPEG? Because I'm sure that affects your workflow as well. I mean, those things are like 50 megabytes a piece. Yeah, um, I'm doing both. Okay. Uh, so raw plus JPEG? Yeah. Okay. And then you just work off the so, JPEGs? Yeah, if I have to get if I have to get the pictures out really quickly, then yeah. Um I just I send work hit the JPEGs and and uh edit them a little bit and just send them out. Yeah. Um instead of instead of the, the raw files because as you as you say, like it takes takes a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what I do, and I'll have uh, I'll have two cards in the in the camera at one yeah. time. What size uh, uh, CF Express card do you have? Um, the sixty fours and hundred twenty, uh, hundred twenty eight. Okay. I think. So you get the RAWs yeah. going to the CF Express, and then the JPEGs go in the SD. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. That's yeah. That's what I'm using right now. Yeah, I tell you, those CF Express cards, they're expensive. I think I spent about 550 bucks for a 512 gigabyte one. But again, I mean, you need it if you want to be able to shoot yeah. 4K 120 um, or, or, or 8K. But but you can shoot yeah. SD cards. You can shoot those with a regular SD card, the stills, all day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, and I like the I like the, the, the Sony Tough, uh, the Tough SD cards. Um, those Perfect. are really good. I have... Yeah, I have a bunch of those, and um, uh, I have I have all my old uh, compact flash cards that I was using with my um, old D DSLRs. Uh, that uh, <laughs> um, I've I've moved over to the SD cards, so yeah. uh, and they're they're quick, you know, the three hundred three hundred megabyte um, f uh, cards, I think. So yeah, they're pretty quick. Oh yeah. Yeah, it blew me away when I uh, I got a CF card, a CFS, CF Express card reader for my CF Express card and dumping to an SD drive, a solid state drive. I was uh, I'm blown away by how quickly I could transfer like 500 megabits or megabytes a second. It was it was insane. But uh, anyways, the future, right? I love it. I love the Canon R5. I highly recommend it if you're considering going to mirrorless. 
think uh, definitely consider it. It's, a, it's an awesome camera. Uh, but I think that's going to bring us to the end of this week's show. We've, we've had a great conversation here talking for almost an hour and a half, so I appreciate your guys' time. Uh, Graham, where can people find out more about you and your work? Yeah, um, well, I have a I have a website, but um, I don't update it too often because I, I'm a staffer, so I I, um, I, I, I put a lot, most of my work on my uh, – Recent work, at least on on my Instagram, okay, uh, which is which is uh, which is my name backwards, which is Jennings Graham. Jennings Graham at Jennings Graham. Okay, you'll find that link in the show notes for sure. Uh, appreciate that, Graham. Thanks again for coming on, uh, David. Where can people find out about more about you and your work? So I'm also on Instagram. My name, which is uh, my name uh, uh, forwards, which is David Buto B U T O W. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, I've got a website and then I'm, I've also in the last uh, a few months, I've started to do some online workshops with Leica because of COVID. You know, these are workshops that you'd normally go out in the field to do with uh, uh, 10 participants or something. But Leica figure out, figured out a way to uh, to do some of these online. So you can check like LeicaCamera.com uh, and you can see some of the some of the workshops that I'm doing with them right now. Excellent. In fact, awesome. there's one coming up on uh, Friday, which oh. is our first day on September 11th. That I think there's a couple of slots still open, so if there's anybody oh, listening nice. that wants to check it out, you can do that. So yeah, Great. Hopefully some people do. I have, that's, that sounds like a great opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, Travis, anything before we sign off? I'm all good today, brother. <laughs> awesome. Hello and welcome to a special Around the Lens extra segment, bonus segment, if you will, featuring... Uh, our special guest, B.A. Van Seis. B.A., please tell the audience about yourself. How you doing? Uh, I'm B.A. Van Seis. I'm a New York-based photojournalist and art photographer. Uh, I, we're doing a special segment because I frankly mucked up some scheduling this morning, and they're being very polite and not mentioning that. Uh, oh, so uh, <laughs> so they, they asked me to come in and talk about a, a topic that's uh, in no way controversial in the photography or art world, and in no way will ruffle any feathers. We're going to talk a little about the Whitney, I think. Yeah, and that's why I want to have you on tonight because, you know, this is news now. It's And it'll still be news a week yeah. from now, but I want to do it while it's still fresh and in people's minds and it's closer People to... People are going to talk about it forever. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so again, yeah, BA has been on the show before, so glad to have you back, buddy. Um, and Thank hopefully we'll have you back on again in the future. But great to have someone who has, you know, again, what we were talking about before, a very in-depth knowledge of this story, close ties to the, the whole Whitney thing. So... Before we kind of get your take on everything that's going on, I'll, I'll quickly recap some of the main aspects of the story for our audience who may not be following uh, what's going on. You can find the links to what we're talking about in the show notes. Um, but basically, uh, this is a story not only from The Guardian, but also from Petapixel. But I'll read the sort of some notes from The Guardian page. Basically, the Whitney is an art museum. It's, it's kind of one of the institutions of New York City. And it canceled an upcoming exhibit after there was a lot of anger from artists whose work was used without their permission. Uh, essentially, you know, the New York Museum came to murder fire from uh, artists because of how they acquired the artwork. Essentially, it was being sold at a very, very inexpensive price um, for a charity, the C in Black Project. And it was a print sale. And so they sold a bunch of stuff for a fundraiser uh, that was launched on June 19th. And they were selling their prints. These are, you know, very, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, very renowned uh, African American um, photographers who were selling their work. Probably, which goes for much more expensive for a hundred dollars as part of this charity sale. And so the Whitney um, essentially acquired a lot of these prints for use. They they plan to use them for an art exhibit. Um, about yes let me see if i wrote down the name of the art exhibit Uh, but it was about essentially you know all the sort of strife that's going on and and a lot of these artists here it is collective actions artists interventions in a time of change so that was the name of the exhibit that was going to be launched at the museum Uh, but once the artists who (laughs) figured out they were part of the exhibit because essentially the I guess the librarian or one of the curators of the exhibit contacted them and said, "Hey, uh, we need your bio for this exhibit we're doing with your work. We didn't tell you we were using your stuff for." Uh, he contacted them for a bio, and essentially, they're like, "Wait a second, I didn't sign up for this." So now there's a there's a lot of big sort of strife because again of, of how the Whitney acquired these images and and how they're using them. Um, so again, glad to have UBA kind of, you know, you've done a lot of work in the art world. You've done work for museums and stuff like that. You know, you've had your own exhibits. 
Uh, so again, talk to us about your sort of impressions of this whole story. Uh, yeah, so there's there's a few pieces of that. The funny thing about it is I was actually supposed to have an exhibit opening today. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> wow. Pre COVID world. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect timing. Uh, no, yeah, so it, it's going to be happening in April next year. Uh, I'm I'm how to phrase this. Uh, I am connected to the the main gentleman who was the protagonist uh, for the the notability of this about 17 different ways. We don't know each other, uh, but we're we're connected every way from from Sunday. We've got the same editors and. I know all the same people. I've also is this uh, Ferris Waba that you're talking about? That Ferris Waba, John Carl Valentine, who is, probably, oh. is, is the primary uh, artist who who brought attention to this. Okay, uh, he, he's he's a, he's a busy working guy uh, here in New York. He he's he's in a lot of publications. He keeps very very busy. I've also about 179 years ago had a picture in a group show uh, that the Whitney did that was sourced in almost exactly the same way. So it. It's it's a pretty standard procedure. Uh, there's a lot of different opinions. It's the only thing that anybody sort of in, in my sort of corner of, of the photo world, the art world, of the art and photo together worlds are really talking about, and it's incredibly complicated. Uh, there's, if you'll forgive me for expounding for a second, there's, there's, there's a legal question, there's an ethical question, uh, and there's a, there's a, I'm going to call it a marketing appearance question. So legally... Uh, is the easiest one to answer, which is that the Whitney did nothing wrong legally. Right. There's there's no way you can spin it where they didn't. Uh, uh, an artist sold a print. He sold it through whatever avenue. It's it's like I think Travis, you sold on the wires over the years at one point too. If you put a picture up on one of the wire services and somebody buys it, you can't necessarily control that. Similarly, these artists uh, they put their prints into a a charity print sale, and they can't control what happens with that either. Someone's buying and an artifact, it is, it is an object, and you're, you're buying it just like if you were, forgive me for putting it this callously, I believe in the arts, but if, if you're buying a sofa, it's the same thing, you do what you want the sofa. So, from a legal standpoint, it's, uh, there, there's there's really no problem. The, the image of it is, is a tough one in a, in a very fast-paced uh, and, and social media connected world. Uh, I personally uh, you know, if how about this? If the Whitney called me and said, "Hey, we've acquired one of your prints and want to put you in a show," I'd be pretty happy about it. However, I don't have the same exposure that a lot of these artists have. I would never, in a trillion years, do a print show like this. Wouldn't do it. If if, if charity wants my money, I'll happily give them money. That's I, I give charity all the time. But the I get probably a request about a, uh, some sort of print show, some sort of charity show, some sort of benefit thing literally once a week, and I never do them. And I, a lot of artists get the same thing for that reason. You can't control... Exactly the same things, that, by the way, that John Carl was complaining about, and he's right, too. That you can't control the quality. You can't control where they go. You can't control w- what happens with them, how they're marketed, etc. But the bigger thing is, uh, I personally happen to like controlling uh, where my work uh, is, is marketed for me. So, for instance, I just had a museum... Uh, in Washington, acquire a whole bunch of my prints. And there's a lot of paperwork involved when they do that. And we go through, how can they do it? So, for instance, my standard writer is, if you want to put on your Instagram, oh, please do that. I'd love for people to know that it's going on. If you want to uh, you know, put it in your, your magazine, your brochure, on your website, absolutely do that. Do you want to sell posters? No, for me, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to make unauthorized prints because quality matters to me a lot. So... You know, John Carlo is, is again, I don't know him, but my understanding from what I've, I've read and, and the posts he's made and, and whatnot are that he's, he's got a big concern about sort of the quality. Years and years ago, I did one of these sort of print shows that, that he did, and that was the big problem for me. They, they used an inkjet printer, took one of, a picture that actually I, I really loved and treasured, and they, they made like 50 cut prints of this picture that I loved, and they sold them off for charity. And the quality was abysmal. And it's something that goes out in your name. And as you know, as, as photographers, as artists, you always want to control your brand. Uh, that being said, the Whitney is an institution. This is how they do things. Uh, I think it's admirable they want to do the show. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite frankly remarkable that they'd want to do a show that's literally that contemporary, that's about a news story that's going on right now. And I get why they wanted to put their hands around that and do it so quickly. Uh, I probably would have spoken to the artist first, just because 
you know, everyone right now is so tense. And everything right now is is so um, magnified. Uh, whatever disaster that happens right now is, is magnified in every way. And if you're going to do an exhibition that is extremely contemporary about an issue that everybody's really wound up about, rightfully so, uh, and you're going to be featuring a bunch of people who are really kind of on the front lines of this, probably have a conversation first, especially if you're if you're coming about it through sort of a backdoor way. That's kind of where I am with that. And there's, there's a lot more nuance to it than that, I think. Uh, you know, I, I've talked to tons of curators about this topic uh, in the last week because it's all anybody's talking about. I've talked to, as I'm sure you both have, tons of photographers about this. And the opinions between both are very different. Uh, the, the, the curators, generally speaking, have the traditional view that I think all curators have had. The only way you can do that job if you're buying a Rembrandt, you can't ask Rembrandt. Now, neither John Carl or I are Rembrandt, and I think there's reasons for that. But you know, you, you, that's just how you have to do business. The Met acquires things, and any museum acquires things. That's how they handle it. So a curator has one view of it, but an artist, you two both know this very well, want their work to be appreciated and want their work to be valued. Mm-hmm. And so the big issue here for me... Uh, I think from a, as, a, as a guy who lives in the museum world, I, I can't pretend that it's not pretty standard business. Uh, as, a, as an artist, I, I get why they're upset. My, my big thing is I think that they could have just stressed it as a different conversation and not done it sort of after the fact. I, th- I think if they had come back and said, hey, here's what we want to do. And by the way, being in the Whitney is a pretty great thing. You're going to want that. It's, it, 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 it made a difference for me early in my career, too. You know, I think there's a different way it could have been phrased, I think is the big issue at hand. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I think the perhaps the folks who were working on this maybe thought, well, these people will appreciate being in the Whitney, right? I mean, the Whitney is a, yeah. a landmark institution. It's been around for a long time. And, you know, people like work very much to get their work into this institution. Like it's very prestigious. So they probably thought, oh, they'll yeah. appreciate it. And obviously some people didn't appreciate it. Um, you know, you talk about how you don't participate in the charity art sales. But, you know, uh, one part that was made interesting in the story is that, you know, Getty, they'll use a sort of sub-license agreement when they sell work via charity that says, hey, you can't use this in an art institution. Do you think had yeah. the charity done that or would you participate in a charity that had more stringent rules about how people could reuse the imagery? Or buy, you know, I, do what they do with the imagery when they buy it. And I think this is, again, and this is a, a something that's up to the individual artist. Sure. The person who's actually creating the work has to do what they feel comfortable with. Yeah. For me, you know, I'm, 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 I'm so quality conscious in, in, in the way that my work is produced. I have very good printers do everything. I, I care a lot about the printing. I care a lot about the way things are shown. I care a lot about how curators handle things. That the, for me to have a charity sale, I'd be absolutely fine with it. If it was benefiting a charity, I believed in it. There's plenty of those. I would personally do it if I was providing the print. I knew what the quality looked like. It's, I, I know that the, the three artists who are primarily upset with what's going on with the Whitney, all three of them said the same thing. It's not named, it's not signed, it's not dated, mm-hmm. which comes into issues of what you call edition versus exhibition prints in, in, in the art world. Can, can you go over which that? For, a huge deal. for those people who yeah. aren't familiar with the art space, when you say name, signed, and dated, what does that mean? Because I think, like, my, my photo has a date as attached to it as a caption, right? You know, and I publish it. Yeah. What, what do you mean by name, signed, and dated with regard to the art scene? So if, uh, it's different if you're talking about photography versus talking about paintings or anything else. If you're talking about photographs, if you are in our medium, you have the ability to make as many prints as you want. You, especially now in the digital world, where you know you're you're not somebody sitting around toiling with actual little negatives, as long as you're me. And then you'd be actually, if you're if you're digital, you can go and you can you can make twelve million clay prints of something if you want to, and you can be the Thomas Kincaid of photography. Congratulations for you. <laughs> uh, what what it generally comes down to is there's two different kinds of prints. I'm oversimplifying a little bit. For whoever wants to send in mail later, I'm I, we all know that I'm oversimplifying this. Uh, there's exhibition prints and there's edition prints. Exhibition prints are, I've made you this print, you're going to show it in your show, it's going to come down, I'm going to punch holes in it, I'm going to destroy it, whatever. Uh, I think with Gary Winogrand, he used to actually punch holes in all of his old prints 
and use them as correspondence. You write letters in the back of them. Uh, edition prints are different. Edition prints are generally what, what I work in, which is you say, I am going to make X number of prints. That can be whatever you want, but it, it maintains the valuation of your work. Every time you make a new print, which is what these charities are usually entitled to do with these, these sales that they do, uh, anytime you make a new print, you devalue the entire body of the work by a little bit because there's just more of it. So, you know, artists handle this differently. Uh, they, you know, I, I do very, very, very small batch prints. I do six prints of anything I'll do and nothing more, which is incredibly small. Uh, there's, there's folks who do pretty big runs, a few hundred, etc. But the reason why you want to have it named, signed, and dated is because uh, you run into uh, estate creations. So there was a, a show in uh, a gallery in Chelsea a couple of years ago. It was, a, it was a Gordon Parks exhibition. Nobody better than Gordon Parks. <laughs> Nothing was dated because all the prints were made after he had already died by his estate. And so it became a, 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 an interesting issue in doing the valuations of it because you say, well, okay, well, they're, they're, they're Gordon Park images, Gordon Park images, but, well, how do, you, how, do you, how do you value these? Because it's the same thing as if you downloaded them online and made a print from, from yourself you know, you know, on your own printer. So how do you handle that? So these, these three right now, they essentially, it's like if I emailed to you, Dave, one of my most precious images from something that I assume is a topic that's very much close to their hearts. And you said, great, I'm going to make some prints on my little Epson printer that I've got in the corner, and uh, Epson comes sponsor me, and, uh, you know, and, and I'm going to do whatever I want with them. And that, that's where it becomes an issue, especially if you're dealing with something that's so hot button right now. If you're talking about, and I appreciate that we're also with three white men talking about this, but fundamentally if you're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement right now, if you're talking about African-American photographers who are making those images, if you're talking about how they control what happens with those images, it's incredibly sensitive. Mm -hmm. And they, they, it's easy to understand why, if you're making that work, you're going to say, well, you know, I want to make sure that it's not being used in a strange way. So, But yeah, so th that comes down to addition stuff. And that's, that's very much legal thing. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, and you mean like physically signed and dated. Like I actually physically take a pen signed, and yeah. sign the corner of the print. Uh, I, B.A. Van Size, I, Giancarlo Valentine, I, Dave Murphy, was living. I had a pulse. My, my hand could hold a pen, yeah. and I did this with my own hand. Uh, okay. Back in the day, actually, a lot, of the, a lot of the printers actually would even write by my hand on wow. the back of the print to show that they'd go into the dark room and done it themselves. It wasn't some peon who they hired on the yeah. oldie craigslist or the back of the village voice to do it yeah no absolutely okay cool uh you know let me throw it over to you um travis you know obviously you represent a lot of different types of photographers art photographers commercial photographers within apa i mean it's american photographic artists right that's the that's what apa stands for have you guys <laughs> have you guys had uh discussions or issues or talked about this or do you deal with or know of any art photographers in your world well we certainly deal with the issues of this um, and not this one in particular but uh, of this type of issue um, and you know I, I whenever I think you know a, a, a huge movement happens I worry about the institutions that instantly go we have to be a part of this and we have to rush to do something and that's the problem is where they don't take the due diligence of taking you know forming a council, forming the right way to do it. You know, they could, they could put an advisory council together. They could reach out to the artists. They could do a lot of things that were, you know, really proper, but they kind of rush out to be part of this movement and make a statement, put it together, which can lead them into these exact problems, uh, which I, you know, which I'm always kind of fearful of. Uh, and that's exactly sort of what they did. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it, the, at the fundamental, like base of everything, the photographer always wants to, to give permission to use his print. And when you're taking that away and not asking them, that that is something that the Whitney at the base of what they are should understand and never have done. And to do that, and I think it, it was not really done by a pure curator. It was done by someone who was called a librarian or something. Or something. So the, the, the whole kind of way that this came to fruition was very kind of odd and uh, it, uh, yeah, it shouldn't have happened the way it did. Yeah, I believe you're talking about the Mr. 
Wabeth, Ferris Wabeth, who was the, the librarian and, and whatnot and yeah. curator for this, but not like a traditional curator, I guess. Uh, yeah, he's not a story. curator per se. Yeah, he's uh, kind of uh, saving images for, you know, the Whitney and uh, and cataloging them and putting them in and taking care of them, which is not curating. Right. And most institutions have something like that at some level. They have yeah, very traditional. Like yeah. So, yeah, so maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit, B.A. So the librarian in this case... He's just building a catalog of work that the the Whitney can use for you know whether it's this project or any project in the future, right? Because like you said, well, they that because they they actually own a physical thing, right? So they because they own actual physical entity, it becomes part of their uh, their their library that is a is a permanent thing. Mm-hmm. So you know, I I have I've done lots of exhibitions. I've got work in uh, five different permanent collections and. When when it happens that uh, work gets put into a permanent collection, which is what happened here with the Whitney, uh, a librarian will will step in and handle the actual sort of forgive me for putting this way, but the not sexy end of it. No, yeah, the actual, exactly yeah. what they're doing. They're they're it's, in charge of you know, Yeah. Don't worry, I never I never thought of sexy in museums in the same context <laughs> ever. Unless it's a sex museum. Where's the librarian will one, be yes, in, you do. Unless the librarian the will be in charge of the curation of it. You know, not the curation, the, the actual, the asset. You know, he knows where it is, how it's going to be written, how it's going to be, you know, uh, listed, everything about all the all the information about that asset he's in charge of and, and where it goes, how where to find it, how to, you know, all this. Where the curator goes to the librarian, I, I'm looking to do a show and I want this, this, and this. And he'll approach the librarian to find where those assets are and get those commodities, yeah. The, the, there's also an, uh, a topic that, that Travis poked into a little bit, which is the, the idea of how, how, how very much this is happening in real time, the story is happening in real time. Uh, whatever the, the issues with the provenance of the images, how they're acquired, etc., a lot of them would have been solved if the show wasn't happening, wouldn't have been happening right now. It's another thing, that a lot of, yeah. like you said, a lot of folks are trying to rush and do things right now. I personally, I, it's not a stone I can throw. I'm not throwing it actually, but you know, I, I, I have work in, that's being used to illustrate a book of poetry that's coming out right now. They took 16 very, very prominent American poets who created work about the pandemic, and they used a bunch of my photographs from the South that I made, that the film photographs uh, back in the, the early summer, to illustrate this book. The pandemic's not over. No one really knows what's happening with it. Nobody knows how it's going to turn out. Everyone's still pretty emotional about it you know we're all sitting here having zoom chats and before not to ruin the magic of this before we all started having this more formal conversation we're all chatting about how it's affected our lives the the three of us will know each other that's something that's very much in people's emotions and i suspect that the emotional register of this for the curators for the photographers who've been involved for onlookers like us three or anybody else is is really ramped up because it's still very much a present thing we're not acting as librarians. We're not looking at, oh, this is a picture that was made in 1978, talking about a thing that was happening, then we'll remove from it. The folks who made these photographs made them weeks ago. Yeah. The, no, this has been going on since June. We're on you know, month three now. These, this is all very much in people's lives. No. You know, I was at a protest this morning you know these are things that are still happening yeah, that's, one of the... that's what i was doing when i was not doing this by the way was after the protest. <laughs> yeah, right so, you know, it, yeah it's still very present i i think it, just, it doesn't give people the, the distance they need to sort of be able to handle this in the with 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 the tender steps that they need to yeah one of the friends of the show former panelist uh, noah berger was actually covering the hundredth day of the protest in portland I think yeah yesterday yeah. or today was that so, uh, how did the protest go? How did your shoot go today, BA? It was it was it was it was quiet. They they've they've there's been a bit of a roller coaster here in New York because it's it's not it's not as heated. Uh, generally speaking, this has been in places like Portland or Kenosha, but here in New York, I've been I, I've been going to the Blue Lives Matters rallies, the Black Lives Matters rallies. There's a lot of distrust between the two of those groups, obviously, who have a weird sort of antagonism symbiosis thing that is kind of going on in the way that they structure the, the rallies there's a, a a disquiet between them and the media too generally speaking everything is just sort of uneasy and then something blows up and then it goes back to being uneasy and then something blows up it's, uh, so it's, it's very much up and down it's not like portland where noah who's been making by the way phenomenal images out there 
yeah. uh, where, where he can just go out any night and you kind of know what's going to be happening. Here <laughs> yeah. it's very uneven. And I think yeah. also it's because people are moving to certain focal points geographically to sort of deal with what's going on in America right now. Yeah. Hey, B.A., just be mindful your microphone is touching your shirt. So just be oh mindful. Uh, there you go. Thank Pop you. Pop my collar for you, baby. Sorry about that. Hey, now. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. It's definitely been uh, a lot of stuff going on. And I believe I remember seeing your stuff and some of your interactions with protesters a few, like a month or so ago, were not yeah. pleasant, like, right? They, they're very oh, oh, no, antagonistic no. towards photographers and media. So they, it, it depends. Because the problem is this. Uh, I've, I've been to both rallies from the right and rallies from the left, if we're going to phrase it that way, which I'm not sure is correct to do, but that, that's how well at the moment, I guess. And what invariably happens is that 99% of the people who are at these rallies are, 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 are there and they're peaceful and they're going there because they have a political opinion that they want to express. You don't need more than one person to behave badly for the situation to change very quickly. Uh, I was at a protest with, uh, uh, I believe, also a friend of your show, C.S. Muncie. Mm -hmm. we, we, we went down to one at 4 a.m. Uh, because we we'd heard their police were going to be doing evictions. They didn't. But we went down there and, you know, these folks had been up for days and were stressed out really beyond belief. And it got really physical really fast. And with, it, with it the police went, and the protesters, right? Not with you no, guys. No, the protesters with us. Oh, Not with the okay. Police. Oh, we, the police will stay across the street and kind of watch, and unless things get really bad, they just... What, what I think is actually kind of the correct thing for the police to do in these cases, just stay away, let people say what they have to say. The police getting involved it doesn't help the situation unless it... it, unless it, it, it actually might even escalate it. <laughs> exactly. yeah. And so there's... I was at one uh, three days ago that got pretty physical here in New York. It happens. Uh, there's There's not really a way out of it per se, and it creates a big uh, crisis of journalistic ethics because you have people telling you that you can't create imagery, you can't be there doing what you're supposed to do. In fact, actually what you're kind of required to do is just tell that story. It's a news story right. that's happening. Mm -hmm. If you leave, you are ceding your responsibility. Right. But they're also not subtle. They're also going to beat you up. And, you know, I, I can handle myself okay in a fight. I don't know how many of these guys would take me to beat me up, but I know how many they do, and it's more than that. So yeah, I don't know how you know, how one really handles that situation. There had been a, a, a big rolling series of, of big escalations between media and some of the protesters at this Occupy City Hall we were having here in New York. And as you both know, the, the photo world is incredibly small. We all talk, and we came to realize it was the same three jerks each time who were starting this, and that is just a terrible thing for the movement they're presenting because that's that becomes a story. Then mm -hmm. you start threatening media, that becomes a story. It is what it is. Um, but also, it creates a situation where you know, when media members feel in danger, at the end of the day, you know, we're all people with with families, with motivations, with with interests, and one of those interests is self-preservation. It, it it creates a really toxic situation really quickly. That's where it goes off the rails. Wow. I think I think I've, I'm friends with uh, Noah on Facebook, and I, I've seen posts coming out that a lot of, in Portland, a lot of the media are having trouble there too, with people trying to the protesters trying to stop them from reporting too. Is that correct? I mean, it seems everywhere. I, I don't know. Yeah. It seems like there's ever present. There's a kind of antagonism, at least from what I can see of my Facebook friends who've posted about it. I'm sure it's not everywhere and everyone it's just a few people who are just very much don't want their photograph taken for whatever reason but you know in these instances where you're saying like you know you're again you're getting into these you know arguments or scuffles or whatever with you know some of the the protesters i mean can't you just shoot from a distance do you, do you have to get up close and, and engage with them or are you choosing I to do what you want to do because that's your right as a first amendment under, you know, under the first amendment to do photography and, and document. And, I mean, that's a complicated and loaded question. I think the answer is yes and no for both. I, okay. I think that, I, I think the truth is yes, you can always shoot from far away, but as you both know, and I imagine the other photo nerdy people who are listening here also know is that s stories are better when they're reported from closer. You want to be close to the story. Sure. 
I think that there's also the, I won't call machismo because it's not, but I think there's the professional pride that kicks in a little bit. Yeah. In saying, if someone tells you to leave, well, I, I wasn't that interested in the story today anyway, but you told me I have to leave, yeah. and now I have to say, thanks for ruining my morning. You know, yeah. I, think yeah. that, I think that becomes part of it, too. It, 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 there's a certain sense of, well, if someone tells you the news can't be there, why can't the news be here? What's going on? <laughs> now you're the story. Like, yeah. It's like a point of for, pride. For, yes. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I would definitely be irritated if someone who, you know, Again, we're both doing the same thing, right? You're practicing your First Amendment right to protest. I'm practicing my First Amendment right to document you protesting. And you're trying to, like, I, I'm not going to tell you not to protest. You can't tell me not to photograph you protesting. And that's the biggest thing. It's this kind of, like, you're, you're protesting. The point of a protest is to gather attention for your cause. You want, we're symbiotic, you know, in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah. And it's just Because the, the frustrating. protesters want... Want, want, want photographers, want media, want radio, whatever, to, to, to show yeah. up and tell their story. Talk about what they're concerned about. And meanwhile, let's be perfectly honest here. People who are in our line of work like protests an awful lot because it's instant and easy news. It's yeah. a layup every day. Yeah. And so, it, it, like you said, you said, it's absolutely about justice. There's no way around it. You know, when you engage with these folks who have... Um, qualms with you being there, do you try and make that argument? Are they receptive to that argument or they just don't want to hear I ab- it? I absolutely make that argument and they're absolutely not receptive. Uh, no. it's, it's funny actually uh, when the the morning that we were, we were discussing when it was 4 a.m. and, and Muncie and I were down there, uh, you you know CS a little bit. He's a, he's a mild-mannered and nice guy. Don't tell him I said that because you know I'm supposed to disparage him publicly. Just between, it's just between you and us. Nobody else is. Okay, is, nobody else. Good yeah, people. nobody else. Uh, but you know, he's he, he's a mild mannered guy, and I'm I'm the other kind, and so it, it it gets interesting because they, I was having this conversation, and I wasn't going to move short of a train knocking me over. Yeah. CS is trying to, to stabilize the thing, and he's making the same arguments that I had just been making. But the reality is they're not there to make arguments. They're not there to listen. They're not there to be receptive. They're there because they're scared. They started accusing CS of being an undercover cop, which is oh, funny geez. if you think about it. But they said, oh, CS, you're, you know, they, 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 want, they took pictures of his, his press badge and said, well, you're, you're wearing <laughs> cop shoes. I don't know what oh, cop shoes God. means, but you're wearing cop shoes and you kind of slam like a cop and you do this like – because they were just you – know, everyone is just so fraught that if you distrust the person who you're speaking with, you can never have an honest conversation with that person. So if you're worried that person is there to do you dirty, you're never going to actually listen to what they're there to say, which if ever is a metaphor for politics in America right now, it's that. So right. how- Absolutely. I want to get back to the, the Whitney discussion really quick and kind of get a, a legal look at the issue. So obviously, like we mentioned, legally, there's nothing wrong with what the Whitney did, right? They can acquire the objects, they can display the objects. And honestly, they could have went forward with the exhibit to their heart's content. They just didn't because of the public backlash. From a, like, just legal perspective, let's say I open the Dave Murphy Around the Lens Museum of Visual Journalism, right? I have my building, I acquire a bunch of prints from all of our guests and panelists, and I hang them in the building. I can charge admission for people to go see those pictures on that wall. But where is the my ability to promote this exhibit? You know, because like if I want to promote like, oh, the B.A. Van Sice uh, wing of my exhibit. Right. I want to use his images in that promotional that is material. Fun. Is that where then the sort of issues be with copyright and, and whatnot come into play? Or am I free to just, you know, use your material to promote my exhibit of visual journalists? So, I mean, there's something that Travis, who handles this a little more closely, the legal side, will probably speak to you better. But with all the sales that I've done to institutions, there's always been a marketing agreement. There's yeah. always something that says you can use it A, B, and C. Okay. Like I said at the beginning of this, for me, it's always just you can't make prints. You want to put in your Instagram, you want to put in your brochure, knock yourself out, but you just you can't sell prints. Okay. Uh, any institution would do it that way. Where the reality is, that, Travis, Correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I would assume that if I sold one of my prints to Travis and he sold that print to you, fundamentally there's still a providence there and you can still do with whatever you want is the truth of it. I don't, I don't think there'd be legally any issue with that. I mean, I'm sure that there's some some, some lawyers that march in here and probably disagree with me, but I don't think there'd be any legal issue with it. 
And Travis is muted. Uh, <laughs> you know, hey, I just didn't want to cough or anything while you guys were talking. Uh, no, you're you're absolutely right. I, if you look at how many how many you know collections are, that are donated to uh, to museums, they're from private collections, and that's you know exactly how the museums deal with a lot of their you know their curation and stuff like that. These are from private collections, so it can be shown from one to the other, you know, and, and shown that way. And uh, uh, I'm not sure how they. They must do something in terms of the, the the estate or something when when they put that catalog together, the book of that show at a museum. Once because of the private uh, images are going into that book as well. Yeah, because I'm just oh, thinking like every time I've seen an exhibit, right? There's always a giant banner plastered on the outside of the the museum saying, "Come see the MoMA." you know, or whatever, Monet's and whatever, and it's a, just a giant print of the art or the photograph or something. And, you know, a lot of times, so sometimes it's in the public domain because it's an, an ancient piece of art history or whatever, but, you know, for more modern stuff, and, you know, again, like I'm saying, I acquired somebody's photograph from a week ago, a print. I want to advertise my, you know, B.A. Van Sice collection. Can I make a giant poster of that and hang it outside the front of my building? Or can I put an ad in the, the newspaper saying, come out to see the B.A. Van Sice exhibit? You know, what point do I have to include you in that if it's my object and my print that I own that I'm promoting the exhibit of, you know? That's what I was trying to get well, at. Well, I'd assume that comes from the standard copyright issues, actually, to okay. the truth, because it's still a copyright image. Sure. So if you're making reproductions, for a poster that you're not selling, but you're, you're doing that, I would assume it comes, comes into standard copyright law. Well, like you said, if it's ancient, if the person who made it has been long dead, you don't have the copyright issue. If it's me uh, and you're doing a show at the B.A. Van Size wing, by the way, thanks for that. I, I think it'll be you're a welcome. show. You're welcome. <laughs> that, it's a small um, wing. It's next to the I, bathroom, but it's, it's an, you know. We're going to get to the story about the bathroom, bathroom bar in a second. <laughs> uh, so the... Uh, the uh, then I think it just comes down to regular copyright stuff, and I'd assume that it actually just approach the artist. They do actually something fundamentally pretty similar to what the librarian at the Whitney was doing, saying, hey, we're giving you a heads up, we want to do this, this, and this. Yeah. And I can't... Um, I'm going to try and phrase this in the most non-loaded way I can. I can't imagine any artist being approached and saying, hey, we're doing an exhibition of your work, uh, we'd like to make a poster, can we have it for the copyright? Reasonably refusing that. I mean, if someone wants to do a show of your work at a certain point... You know that's part of the equation. The other, the other factor, frankly, is that it's it's a sort of an ugly, horrible secret in the art world. But generally speaking, artists who are given big exhibitions uh, aren't paid for any of it if it's wow. a temporary exhibition. The, the they they do it essentially as a marketing endeavor. Really? There's exceptions, but I mean, of the of the of the six sole exhibitions that I've booked in my life, I was only paid for one of them. Wow. And all the rest of them, they paid dividends, and I'm glad I didn't. Every single one of them, I'm very glad I did them on the back end. Uh, but the dividend is other than just getting a check from somebody here or there. Uh, you know, if, if somebody if somebody was to buy all the copious prints that I've sold to Travis, and one day MoMA calls me and say, hey, we want to do a BA Van Size exhibition thanks to the generous donations that Dave Murphy has made to fund the whole thing. I'd, and they said, we want to do a poster. I'd say either A... I'm represented by APA or some group that can would handle copyright negotiations for me, or B, oh, I'd love to have a show in my own wing at the moment. Let's do that, sure. And I, th I think that's, that's the more practical reality of it. Yeah. Okay, interesting. You say pay dividends. We say exposure. I, 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 well, it, it depends, actually. So it's it, exposure is one. I mean, I feel pretty exposed these days, you know. Uh, that's not really what it is. There's, there's, there's two factors for it. Number one is, if we're talking about a nuts and bolts thing, it's, it's frankly this: the more you're shown in museums, the more your work is worth when you sell it down the road. Uh, okay. I call it exposure. That's fine. That's, yeah. that's a thing. Yeah. But it's true. You know, I've, I, I had a big show at the CCP last year, and that increases the value of the project, increases the value of the book that came off the work, etc. Yeah. So that's it, it's, it's not just exposure; it's an actual real value increases thing and the opposite is is also true it's like a credibility thing just, right like the more your work uh, is shown oh my work this is shown at the moma so it has a much higher like value to the art collector mm -hmm. okay oh yeah absolutely a hundred percent by the way we're talking about edition prints and exhibition prints before this, this also plays into that as well i had an exhibition in kansas city at the tail end of last year and uh they were 
edition prints, and it was, a, it was it's the work that is absolutely most important to me. My this film photograph series I've been working on and will be for the rest of my life. And uh, when it was being shipped back, uh, one of the two major shipping companies in the United States of America lost it. And it's it's a absolutely horrific thing if you're an artist to exhibit because now you have an entire you can imagine this Travis it's an entire edition set wow. that no longer exists oh, you can't control don't know where it is changes your valuations for the entire show forever and wow. I had to explain to by the way a librarian listen I know this doesn't, it sounds like prints and yeah I can go to you know Adorama and have prints made sure but that's not the same thing fundamentally it's a block of work that has now disappeared wow. and this is why it actually has value if you if you, if you handle your work that way so that, that's where it comes into play. Too. There must be some type of insurance on that is being oh, carried. Oh, there was. Yeah. The yeah. funny thing is, this is this um this this major shipping company that I'm trying diplomatically not say the name of. What uh, they rhyme they came with? Back, even, Just kidding. Uh, they rhyme with Medex. Red Tex. Uh, yeah, Red Tex. And so the funny <laughs> thing is, actually, they're 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 pretty universally used in the art world, and they're known for being reliable. Yeah. They actually do. You generally speaking, do a great job. Uh, except in this one case, where I'm pretty sure some delivery man in the middle of the pandemic who was worried about his life, saw the valuation on the insurance and said, Oh, I'll, I'll just, I think this will be fun to take home with me and try and sell on eBay or whatever. Uh, and so it, it became an interesting insurance boondoggle because the gallery had taken out a absolutely proper and frankly significant amount of insurance on it. They did everything absolutely right. They took out the insurance. They shipped it the right way. They required it signature delivery. They required signature delivery. They did absolutely everything perfectly. And then this company that rhymes with Schmedex, uh, they said, "Oh, unfortunately, we don't we don't insure items of exceptional value." Well, you took the insurance policy. You 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 know you you took that money. You issued the policy. So yes, you do. And it became a big giant thing that dragged on for wow. absolutely months. And the worst part was, this is the, the curator at this gallery, who again did nothing wrong, was getting pretty worried because you know this is a, it's a big deal, it's a small gallery too, and so she she's just absolutely terrified because she's the only person, other person in this whole thing who understands that losing a set of edition prints is a horrific thing to happen, <laughs> and you know it's 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 wow. it's just the way it is. It's, it, it'd be like if they lost a bunch of paintings fundamentally because you don't make that many of them. So yeah, yeah. But I hope that I hope that. Oh, I imagine the guy opened them up and went, "Oh, it's a bunch of black and white photographs. What a bunch of crap this is!" And threw it out in the garbage. And it's just like floating in a river in Queens or wherever garbage goes from here. It's gonna <laughs> be found in someone's the... attic, you know. <laughs> no. no. Years, years, years from now. now, yeah, years from now, they'll, yeah. somebody will find it well, and be like, do a documentary well, luckily, about it. they're they're titled and they're signed and they're dated, so that worked out. <laughs> And they have like a little return to B.A. Van Syce if found. Should actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, uh, I was going to say something. I thought now I've, I've drawn a blank, but um, I hope they find your stuff. Well, no, about insurance. Okay, I dealt with this because I, I thought uh, my laptop was lost in the mail and I had had it insured uh, when it was shipped here to Korea via USPS. And I was going through the insurance claims process and something they don't really tell you you know, when you buy insurance is that you have to prove that it's the value of the insurance you bought it for if you go for an insurance claim. So like when I was doing my insurance claim for my laptop, they were they wanted receipts from the yeah. company that, you know, proves, oh, this is a $2,000 laptop. It wasn't enough just to buy $2,000 worth of insurance. You know, they wanted that for the proof of claim. So I guess with artwork, you have to have proof from a value like a, a appraiser, I would assume, who says, hey, this was worth a million dollars or whatever, you know, the value is. So, but yeah, it's kind of funny that they'll take your money for the insurance, but then they'll say, oh, no, it's not worth it. We don't do that. You know, yes, you do. Yes, you do. They'll say you don't. Which, which, by the way, is also another reason why one should not do a charity print sale. When, when I had my issue with the insurance and this gallery and whatnot, one of the things I, I had to do was, I had to provide appraisals from another museum that acquired some of my work recently. And so I said, well, here are prints, which, thank God, were the same exact size. So nothing else I could explain to some person pounding away at a computer at the Schmedex insurance company that, you know, they, here's a valuation for something comparable. If you have been sell if you've actually literally been giving away prints for free that are then sold for $100, it wrecks your valuations everywhere else. Right, so. yeah. It's like, how can, you, how can you justify the same print is worth you know, a billion dollars yeah. or whatever the price you label it at. Okay. My, my grandmother used to call it, my grandmother used to call it uh, uh, penny wise and pound foolish. 
at the end of the day, by the way, the the work that these the, the artists are making about the protests right now, and some of it's really phenomenal. But as you both know, photography becomes more interesting the older it gets, mm. the further you get away from the time period it's made in. And yeah. so the pictures that are interesting now will be time capsules one day. We have we yeah. have a, a camel of interest in our in our work. It's very interesting that it's first created, then people forget about it. And then 50 years later, here's a picture of somebody marching in 1954 in Selma. Oh, the picture's interesting again. Everyone's dressed differently. Everyone's living a different life. It's a different world we can't imagine. It's a different century and a different country in, in many ways. And so true. You know, it's, it's, it's not a great investment. I hope they don't hear me and get members saying that. But just it's anybody who's out there who's considering doing one of these charity print sales, it's not necessarily a great investment in the long-term value of your work. Yeah, no, good, good advice, good points, and I don't, I don't plan to participate in charity sale anytime soon. But if I ever do, I will keep that in mind for sure. Give, the, give, give money to charity; they like that better. It's easier, to, easier to put in the bank. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, you know, again, you'll have a place always, uh, BA, in my bathroom of my uh, museum. Uh, you will, uh, you'll get probably more traffic there than anywhere else in the facility. Um, but I'll uh, send you one of my self portraits to scare the shit out of everybody. <laughs> Indeed, we'll put that over the urinal, like you know, we're just looking down, we looking go. down, perfect. You know, just look, looking condescending. Hmm, I don't know. Indeed, indeed. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say about the Whitney thing that I didn't think to ask? I don't think there is. No, you've been okay. you've been quite comprehensive. It's a very, it was a very good summation by you, and uh, well thought out. I appreciate I your, I your thoughts. Hope I didn't screw it up. By, uh, it, you know, no. It, really, Actually, actually, I do have one thing I want to say, which is this. I think it actually it's um, the truth is that um, John Carl is a wonderful artist, and the Whitney is actually whatever the politics might be right now. It's actually a wonderful museum, and I think this is more a a problem of rush and appearances, mm-hmm. and it actually yeah. is a malice by anybody. And everybody's got high opinions about it, but I think the truth is that everybody's just trying to do the right thing, and just people are dancing badly more than people are stepping on feet intentionally. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, I don't think this was necessarily someone or an institution trying to act badly. I think it was just sort of a poor, poor series of decisions, right? Like a poor execution of decisions versus necessarily like someone with bad intentions, right? If you're thinking about it on paper, it's you know, if I want to have a, the, if I want to become the curator of the Dave Murphy Museum, and I see some work that I think would be interesting for an exhibition, I'm thinking about doing, which they must have been thinking about doing since the beginning of this. And I find out that, oh, I can acquire the work and I can benefit a charity that is directly related to the work that I'm hoping to present with this gallery show. That's kind of it feels like a win for everybody unless you think about, well, what's what's everybody in everybody else's head? What's everybody else going to think about this? How is this going to be handled by person X, person Y and person Z? If you're thinking about it in a very abstract way, which people can criticize that and, and should and, and will, but that's a pretty natural thing that a person might walk in and say, Oh, I think that's a, a great idea. I can, I can, I can buy a print. I can have a show. I can give money to uh, a charity that supports black lives matters causes. This is, this is a, feels like a win. Meanwhile, the artists who make it see it from a different way. But yeah. fundamentally it's everybody just trying to do the best they can. Absolutely. All right. Great. Uh, Travis, you got any more thoughts or opinions about this topic before we end tonight's no, I think special it segment? Very well and, Carried very well and nice, nice and thoroughly. So, yeah, great. I, great. I am concerned, by the way, that Travis's white balance has changed over the course of this. My what? Your white balance has changed. You've gotten blue. Yeah, you're getting bluer and paler as we go on. <laughs> yeah, you're very Smurf-like right now. That's very odd. That shouldn't happen. Mm. I gave That's myself new... this this tan I, that I've, I've I've earned here in the great indoors. Yeah, yeah it's huh. like B A. You're super yellow, uh, and. Uh, Travis, you're super blue, and I'm trying to like I'm I'm in the between. I'm trying to be balanced here. Is that better? Oh, yeah. marginally, yeah. Yeah, something must be off. My, my camera must have on oxygen. It's all my right. camera must have been reset or something in right, <laughs> between well, shows. Anyway, we'll, we'll work on that after the show. But again, thank you, BA, so much for taking time out Thanks, to kind gentlemen. of explore this again. issue. I, I think you probably gave sort of the best. Uh, perspective and summation of it short of having someone who is directly involved in it so definitely appreciate that and uh, good luck good, good luck in all your future exhibits and uh hopefully get get those art prints someday um or right. find them in a you know again like in the trash 50 it's years from good. now and they'll, they'll be they'll be an art exhibit for as a historical artifact 
So what happens if uh, you know the insurance pays out on it and they find them? I don't know. I don't know. That'll be that'll be an interesting thing. It'll be by a, a person being declared dead and then found. I suppose. I don't know how it works. <laughs> Well, once you get paid for the insurance and the, they, you know, the if, if you get paid, you know, the as far as the insurance company is concerned, they wipe their hands of the situation once they've paid you. There's no yeah. requirement to pay them back after it's been discovered. As far as I know, my limited knowledge of insurance, but, you know, I could be wrong. Don't go by that. I'm not a lawyer. They can, they can try and deliver me the uh, prince at whatever a little a deserted island I'm living on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> they may, if you, do, if you suddenly do an exhibit with those shows, like after you get paid, then there might be some... Uh, mm -hmm. Some people at your door asking about that, but, you know. Uh, anyways, all right. Well, that's been it for this Around the Lens special part two segment, talking with B.A. about all the bonus, art fun bonus. stuff. Uh, B.A., is there any place you'd like to direct people towards to find more about you or your work? Um, I don't know. My website, my Instagram, whatever. It's just my name, B.A. Van Size dot whatever dot com dot Instagram. Or whatever. <laughs> Whatever people got to do, that I don't know. Org -ish -ish got it. Dot, dot org. -ish. You heard it here, folks. BA dot <laughs> whatever dot Instagram dot com dot website. All right, great. All right, well, if you'd like to follow what we're doing, go to aroundthelens.com. You can find uh, show notes uh, to everything we've talked about tonight and uh, links, of course, to every, everybody's uh, Instagram pages and whatnot. If you'd like to support the show, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash aroundthelens and for as little as a dollar a month, get everything due. we do a few days early. And also just communicate with us and support us. And, and all the channels, please, by all means, communicate with us. Let us know what you're thinking about what we're talking about. Um, you know, if you have any thoughts or you know, would like to argue with us in the, the comments, by all means, go ahead and do so. Uh, we'll be happy to, to take that on and talk to you about uh, stuff. And if you have suggestions for comments or guests, uh, questions or topics, uh, please uh, throw them our way. All right. Well, I have been uh, David J. Murphy for Around the Lens. I'd like to thank our two guests for taking time out to be on the show tonight, Mr. Dave Buto. I got that right. Good. Uh, Good. And uh, Graham Jennings. Uh, thank you guys so much for being on. You're always welcome back. For Travis Keys, I am David J. Murphy. This has been Around the Lens, episode 241, and we are out. Thanks for listening to Around the Lens. We hope you enjoyed the show. To continue the conversation, head on over to one of our social media outlets, such as Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or Twitter. To support the show financially, consider donating to us via Patreon. For show notes from this week's episode and links to everything else we talked about, just go to our website, AroundTheLens.com. Finally, if you or someone you know might be a good guest for the show, get in touch with us via email at info at AroundTheLens.com.